Uh, good morning all and welcome to the Infrastructure Standing Committee meeting for the 3rd of November. And uh, now I'd like to open the meeting with the uh, morning prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Okay. Leave of absence. I don't think we have any requests other than apology from Councillor Henshin, who's running a little bit late uh, due to an appointment. So we'll see him shortly. Uh, moving on to uh, recognition of traditional owners. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to acknowledge the country and the land where we meet this morning, the Waka Waka land, and acknowledge the elders, both past, present and emerging. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, you have the uh, agenda in front of you, Councillor. Is there any prescribed or declarable conflict of interest to disclose to the meeting? No? Okay, let's move on then. Uh, 5.1, confirmation of the minutes of the previous meeting can be found at 5 on the agenda and the uh, recommendation is that they re be received. Do we have a uh, mover for such? Councillor Jones, thank you. Second to Councillor Potter. Questions, concerns in relation to the minutes? Matters arising? No? Okay, we'll move on then. Uh, go to the vote. Those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you all. Okay, 6.1. Now I'd like to uh, welcome Councillor Jones to prevent the roads, uh, present, sorry, the roads and drainage portfolio report at page 18. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And again, it's uh, that time in the month for the roads and drainage portfolio for the uh, month of November. And uh, our current design and planning projects as, as we sit, Maiden Mall Bunyan Mountains Road at Wengenville, detailed design for TMR. It's uh, 10 10% complete at this stage. The Cumbia Streetscape, the rehabilitation of the CBD, community consultation finished, detailed design commenced. The Cumbia Road at Cumbia Road widening and pavement overlay, that design is 90% complete. Uh, Youngman Street median treatments, uh, Kingaroy and Wandai, repair and upgrade of medians and roundabouts. Package one, 100% complete. Package two, community consultation complete and design 30% complete. Package three, community consultation complete, design 30% complete. The Oliver Bond car park in Kingaroy, the upgrade car park and lighting facilities, the design is 30% complete in that project. The Wandai Industrial Estate in Wandai, upgrade pavement and intersection to allow for B double access to industrial estate, that design is 80% complete. And I believe that we have very good news that uh, that project is about to get underway and uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, G General Manager, the asphalt will be laid somewhere between the 13th and the 17th of November. So marvellous to see that happening and the Wandai Industrial Estate will be improved immensely for heavy vehicle transport. Gordon Brook off-site storage at Mount Rural and Reservoir. Gordon Brook concept earthworks design for funding application and that design is 70% uh, complete. Our minor projects. <laughs> St Mary's Catholic <laughs> College in Kingaroy, road widening and safety upgrades install new footpath. That design is 90% complete. Wandai State School at Wandai, safety improvements 50% complete. Kingaroy State High School, design 50% complete. Palmer Street in Mergen, Curb and Channel Works, design is 30%. John Street, Kingaroy, uh, design has commenced there. Haley Street, Kingaroy footpath, also installed. That is for the install new footpath, rehabilitate existing footpath from PCA to Anderson's, and that design has commenced. We then move into our current and planned works for November, and uh, as of the 14th of October 2021, uh, Capital Works, Blackbutt CBD, the Blackbutt CBD footpath renewal procurement currently underway, uh, expected to start in January and expected to be completed by May. Uh, so uh, we then got to Harris Road, pavement rehabilitation works underway, that should be completed uh, as we sit here today. Jorgensen's Road, Glenview, pavement rehabilitation works underway. That also should be very close to completion at the or through this month of November. Kingaroy Transformation Project, Kingaroy CBD upgrade, again continuing along and uh, and hopefully completed by October 22. And uh, the work that they've done there, the staff should be highly commended and everyone involved. That's just changing the, uh, the look of the CBD in Kingaroy. Memorambi Barkers Creek Road at Corndale, upgrade a section from unsealed to sealed standard between 14.5k to 15.5. 
that will uh, be undertaken from this month through to March. And I've spoken to Lachlan Brown yesterday with the feedlot out there, and he's uh, cooperating as along with us as council to let his uh, transport people know that there will be work going on through that period and to uh, take extra care. Springs Road, Chelmsford, seal pavement reconstruction. That'll go through October into November. Weckers Road at Warulan, the seal pavement reconstruction. That'll be this month. Wandai Industrial Estate, as I mentioned earlier, through November, December, and that will be completed, but uh, I think that uh, it will be well ahead of schedule because of the uh, equipment being in our area. Bitumen Reseal Procurement Evaluation currently underway. That will continue from this month through to March. Our gravel resheating program, we've got Bonier Road. Uh, there's a whole heap there. Bonier Road, Baldy Road at Brooklands, Hazeldean Road, South Nanango, Major Road, Nanango, McNamara's, Brooklands, Perrots, Bowie, Smith Road, Bowie, and uh, the list. There for the uh, gravel resheating program, that will be expected to uh, go from all well, different start dates, but they should all be completed by the uh, month of uh, December. Our patrol grading also are right across the region. We've got Bowie, Brooklands, Coolabunya, Gordonbrook, Keys, Keysland, Kingaroy, Kinleymore, Newmga, Oakadon, Pimp and Bungie, Proston, Storworth, <coughs> Tarong, Wengenville, Wandai. Uh, right across there, so across the whole region again, our, our uh, crews are doing a wonderful job. Roadside slashing and boom mowing, the rec recommencement of the general slashing program is weather dependent and is currently being planned to start delivery in November. Isolated slashing is currently underway, targeting higher growth areas as per the completed works table for October. So our completed works for noting in October, Memorambi Barkers Creek Road at Wattle Camp, that was upgrade road to sealed standard, that is 100%. Tabinga State School, Kingaroy, regrade and seal drop off zone drainage issues in car park, 100%. And Gore Street, Mergen, rehabilitate existing footpath, 100%. So again, I mentioned that is design and planning projects, so they are ready to go. Capital Works, Williams Road in Banark, an upgrade from unsealed to sealed standard, project nearing completion awaiting the line marking. And uh, that's another great success story. Gravel resheeting, Mundubra, Jurong Road, Jurong. Travelled that road the other day, and uh, it's uh, at this stage, it's in great condition. So uh, hopefully the work's have been done there and we can get an upgrade coming through. And you, maybe through the federal election, all these people that are running for the federal seat may uh, commit to uh, doing that road. Patrol grading, Abbeywood, Benair, Bowie, Brooklands, Highsville, Inverloor, Kingaroy, Newmga, Speedwell, Storworth. Again, continuing right across the region, uh, Tabinga, Tablelands and Wigton. Our roadside slashing, Brooklands, Bull Camp, Eastern Ango, Kingaroy, Manning, Merlewood, Stonelands, Tablelands. And those guys will certainly be uh, becoming very busy in the next couple of months with the uh, predicted rainfall that's coming and the current stuff that they've got to deal with. Turn over the page, we've got a couple of infrastructure works, customer requests uh, for year to date and uh, Councillor Shoemaker's questions there in the last standing committee about the concerns over the uh, amount of roads that were done. If you have a look down there, 635, there's an explanation underneath there. And anyone that wants to have a look at it, it's on our website to, uh, to uh, check up on and see the progress of our crews across our whole, whole network of roads. A quick, uh, Another one, a paved liner truck is used to complete specific types of pothole and edge breaker defects. The truck operates by dispersing compressed pressured, pressurised air to spray bitumen emulsion material from an arm at the front of the truck. From there, the truck passes over the sprayed section, leaving a layer of aggregate. This machine is used for shallow seal rehabilitation repairs, including potholes between 5 mil and 75 mil in depth and minor edge breaks. It can also be used to temporarily seal a finished pavement repair to hold a pavement service together to allow traffic accessibility until a final seal can be undertaken. And again, Mr Mayor, uh, I have no hesitation in congratulating the staff, men and women outside doing the work and also the people that are involved inside. They do continue to do it. I was out in the uh, community yesterday at the uh, Cumbia races and I was just completely floored with the amount of comments about the road network being improved in the last three or four years. So, to, uh, could you please pass on to the staff, Mr General Manager, that, uh, as I always say, we are not perfect, but where we come from in 2016 to where we are now, it's a hell of an improvement and we continue to see improvements, so congratulations to all involved. 
And on that, I would like to move my roads and drainage portfolio report for the month of December be accepted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Do we have a second? I thank Councillor uh, Duff. Okay, uh, questions, comments? Councillor Duff, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Just to, um, really pleased about the one-night industrial estate. But I, ju I just wanted to flag that yesterday I was at the RSL um, for Melbourne Cup Day. I was um, emceeing and I, that we were running out of things while we were waiting for the, sw for the sweep, running out of things to say. So I just mentioned about the one-night roundabout and how it, we'd chosen the option too. But there was um, a lot of questions about the, the Christmas tree and I just wanted to flag that there was a lot of people... Uh, concerned about where the Christmas tree was going to go. So just letting Councillor Henshin know that I was surprised. I thought that it was pretty much everyone was on board with the Christmas tree being in um, the park, but there's a fair bit of angst around where it's going. So just flagging that for you. Um, just wanted a couple of questions. On um, the Gordon Brook offsite storage in Mount Maroon Reservoir, it's 70% complete. I'm just wondering when will the design be complete and is, do we have any costings on that yet? That's just a question, thank you. Yeah, Mayor Otto uh, and Councillor Duff and Councillors, uh, the the work that's undertaken at the moment is in pre is in preparation for the expression of interest process. So certainly we've had our head down uh, in relation to getting enough concept information together uh, in order for us to get an opinion of cost and uh, to get that information together. We now are focused specifically on the off-stream storage, of course, following Council's resolution. Um, and as we've confirmed uh, details for that, we've had to fine-tune its exact location. Uh, we must issue a, um, a plan of survey for the exact location that we want, so we've got to make sure that that site is big enough to fit our works in, and that's been our focus. So the costings will be an opinion of cost, sufficient at the expression of interest phase. We have until April to further advance our concept, and we will use a significant amount of that time, given the scale of this job. Um, full detail design, to correctly answer your question, will be part of a design and construct project. So the absolute final detail of it will be delivered as part of the works, subject to us being successful. Thank you. I'm very happy with that comprehensive answer. Thank you. Um, so just one more question. This is just on Jorgensen's Road. So I know that it's a capital upgrade and pavement rehabilitation, but I have had some um, pushback from some locals saying that at the same time, like Rex Schultz Road, which is right beside Jorgensen's Road, has got a lot of washouts, and they were hoping that while the graders and all the um, gear was there that we would just slip down. It's only a very short road. And I'm just wondering, is that, is that something that we consider or do we just, if we're doing a particular capital upgrade and there's a road right beside it, that we wouldn't do that until we just went and did patrol grading? Or how does that work? Because it's just the perception in the, um, to, in the, to the locals is why wouldn't you just go and fix up those washouts? Just that, that's just a question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so Jorgensen's Road is uh, uh, is a rehabilitation work. It's not a capital upgrade, um, and it's part of our capex. Um, so that's that's been an approved project for us to complete. In terms of uh, say washouts in 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 the area, um, yeah, we will we will generally look and see what defects we have, particularly on our reflex system. And if it's appropriate, we will address those. Um, happy to, to have a look at that specific one. Um, if, if the work is of a capital nature, then, then that's typically outside the, the operational budget and, and that generally won't happen um, in, terms of, um, in terms of doing that work. Um, but happy to look at uh, Rex Schultz Road, was it? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. I, ha I have actually sent it through, um, hoping that they could do it before they shifted the gear. But I, yeah, I'm not sure if the gear's already shifted. But just to, that, yeah. So it's just that's um, yeah. I've already sent it through. It's in the system. Yep. Thank okay. You. 
Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Henshaw. Thank you, Mr Mayor. My apologies to my colleagues this morning for being a little bit late. I had a, a, a medical appointment and sometimes, as I'm sure we're all aware, you don't get in and out of them very quickly sometimes. But yeah, I'm here and I'm uh, fit and fighting, ready to go. So, clean bill of health. Uh, just in response to Councillor Duff's question on the Wandai uh, Christmas tree, six community consultations were had, held down in Wandai over many weeks. And the feedback that was received from there, and it was noted on their forms and people's perception of that was there was probably, in those community feedback, 75% of people commented on that Christmas tree. So, uh, and that was, uh, dare I say, favourable to get it shifted to the Coronation Park. So, yeah, just like to note that. Councillor Shoemaker. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. I, um just, it's great to have the update in relation to Harris Road, and I do have to ask the question, because I have had a number of constituents in the area raise it with me, um, just in relation to the fact that we'd budgeted $300,000 for the road. I wanted to confirm, is the actual there $55,000 true and correct? Um, that seems like quite a shortfall. Um, and as the team know, the question I'm going to ask is, uh, why there weren't any drainage works considered in, in the parcel of work. Um, because the concern is, of course, that we have done the pavement re rehabilitation, which everyone is very satisfied and very pleased about. Um, but the concern, of course, is the longevity of that if there is actually no drainage work. So I'd just like the team to speak to that, please, and give an update as to what work has been done. Um, to, I guess, protect the pavement and ensure it won't um, end up with the same issues that we we had prior to fixing this. So that's my question, Manager Jed. Uh, thank you, Councillor. In terms of the the budget amount and the actual, that's uh, that's a new in our report. That's a new couple of new columns, and it's uh, to provide some additional information. It is. Uh, it is in the context of timing, so that's a, a project that's recently been completed and at the time of the report that was what's been taken out of Tech One. So what you'll find is that project will be in the order of two hundred and thirty to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars likely, uh, as our costs come through. And we'll report on that in the in the standing committee reports. Um, so so um, uh, particularly the projects that are in progress, you will find that that uh, there may be a period of lag between the actual uh, amount of uh, amount that's reported in there and the 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 final cost. In terms of uh, Harris Road, the project was very specifically rehabilitation. It was a, a very poor section of road, rutted on the the upstream side. And the purpose of the project was to address uh, those defects uh, rather than an upgrade. So what we've done is addressed the subgrade issues and we've strengthened the pavement through the addition of uh, cement. Um, and that includes the, the floodway. So in terms of um, any drainage upgrade, it's essentially the project was rehabilitation of the existing drainage, which is a floodway. Yes, thank you for the clarification. <coughs> Manager, just in relation to John Street, Kingaroy, um, I think we'll probably recognise it's one of those streets that have for some time needed work and quite poorly, um, quite significantly debilitated. Um, any timing around that, to uh, your knowledge at this stage, for the completion of the design work, uh, James, on that? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr Mayor. Uh, in relation to John Street, it is a, a current design that we are uh, uh, looking to deliver on, we should have an update at the next standing committee on how close we are to completing that design. Uh, our forecast timeline, I think, is for the end of this month, so we should be very close at that point in time, but I will have more information um, at December's Infrastructure Standing Committee, if that is okay. Oh, much appreciated. Thank you, Manager. Okay, Councillor Schumacher. Sorry, one final question. Um, 
Just in terms of resources for designing, I know we had a lot of conversations about this during the budget process and I just wanted some clarity in terms of how many actual council resources or dedicated resources do we have actually working on design projects at this point in time and are we accessing any external support or are we relying heavily on our internal resources and staff to deliver on that? Might be a question. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Thanks, Councillor. Um, as part of our... We, we do have an internal team, um, but we also do have uh, a couple of vacancies as well in that design team as well at the moment. So we are... Uh, we have two external design consultancies working with us in, in order to deliver our design program right now. Um, they are assisting us across the, the myriad of projects that are reported on, uh, as you do see this morning. Um, but they will also be working on uh, other projects as well. As, as those design projects are completed, there is a backlog of other projects that need to come in behind them that need to be delivered as part of, uh, yeah, the current financial year program. Thank you, Manager. Comfortable with that, Councillor? Yes, thank you. Very good. Okay, if there's no further questions uh, or comments in relation to the report, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you, staff. Uh, 6.2 is the Kingroy Transformation Project update at 26. We'll go straight to you. Thank you, Project Manager. Yeah, good morning, Mr Mayor and Councillors. Um, just the um, first of the updates, obviously we've got a, um, a large amount of construction up in Haley Street at the moment. I think it's um, fairly, fairly obvious that we're pushing along there at the moment. Um, we have a number of crews working up there. We've been there for a number of weeks. Our progress up there to, at the moment is very, very good. Um, it's probably our fastest stage at this point in time. We are we're hooking through. Um, we originally were looking to only go to towards Run and Horn between now and Christmas. We are now going to make it to the traffic lights, um, which will, will get us up to that intersection. The reason for that is there's a substantial change of work when we come down Kingaroy Street. So Kingaroy Street has the same utilities but doesn't have the same pavement work. So it has a lot of the risks and the issues that we have with the existing pavements are not, don't exist in Kingaroy Street. A lot of that is asphalt topping. So we can work on both sides of the street and we should move through there quite quickly. Um, and we're currently talking to businesses around when that will happen. Um, but at this stage, we expect with our current progress um, to be curb and channel in and, and road installed. Um, in Alfred Street and in Haley Street by the end of this month, which is very, very quick. So um, at this stage, we expect that we will be starting into um, Kingaroy Street in January. Um, obviously, it's back to school time. There's a few businesses there that are affected by that, so we'll be working with them to see how that looks. Um, it's likely that we will come from the Alfred and um, ha Kingroy Street intersection and work our way back up through there as well. So just in the report there, I put a few photos. Um, I think everyone's aware of that. I probably also, just while I mentioned, um, we will be doing asphalt uh, works in Alfred Street uh, next Wednesday. Um, Fulton Hogan will be here to, to nail that straight out. We're also putting a um, uh, some minor maintenance around the place as well in the CBD. We're going to fix a few defects. I think the uh, Queen Street intersection, Mr Mayor, which you've raised with us previously, I think they're going to put some AC through that while they're here for that in Wondor and a few others. So uh, we'll fix, we'll take opportunity to have that sort of gear here to, to do some complementary works. Um, we'll actually start construction or digging out the road um, in Alfred Street tomorrow afternoon at this stage um, and basically try to have that ready by Tuesday, Wednesday next week to allow um, that asphalt to come in. Those crews will arrive, do that AC. They will then go to Wondor. Uh, where they will do the EME2 run overlay on Wondai. Um, they will then have um, their four-day shutdown per their safety requirements. They'll then come to Haley Street um, and arrive here on the 22nd, 23rd of November. And then they will spend um, probably six six or seven days here at um, KTP and they'll go back and put the final surface on Wondai uh, with the AC14. So very coordinated works at the moment between ourselves um, obviously Kevin's other teams, but also Fulton Hogan as well um, to, to bring that sort of gear out. It's fairly substantial. Just in progress, in we've um, completed a lot of our landscaping. So just go down to page 29 there, Linnell. Just go back up to the – I'll just show a couple. Um, you can see the mulch is in there. The firewheel trees will be here tomorrow morning. So that roundabout will commence planting tomorrow morning um, around 9 o'clock. 
and also the Silky Oak will be coming out. It is getting relocated to Apex Park tomorrow morning. So um, we've worked in partnership with our parks team to make that happen. Um, we've got shared gear from virtually everywhere. We've actually um, have our Merg, Merg and Water and Wastewater team here this morning prepping for that because we've obviously got to do some stuff with the utilities to get that out. Um, so, yeah, we're seeing good combined effort across the organisation, which is great. Just down in Linnell for us, we, we continue to do our videos there. Um, I think everyone recognises the two councillors. Um, our videos up at Haley Street have been very well received by the community and appreciated by the businesses. Um, and, the, and it's not all smooth sailing, as we know, building these sort of projects. So some of the issues and the discussions we've had up there have been, um, you know, quite constructive and thought out. And we're doing absolutely everything we can to support those businesses. Again, just want to acknowledge the councillors' support and also um, Luke and Christy who have been out on the ground there with the team, um, doing a wonderful job talking to those businesses. Again, some things are, are easier than others um, and they're up there doing a very good job to try and um, compensate and, and work with people as much as we can um, to, to limit our impact. Um, and again, I say it every time, our speed is our biggest biggest thing we can do for, for businesses to get out there as quickly as we can. Um, just go down, Linnell, just on the map there, that shows our, our scope of work. Obviously, uh, what you'll see there up towards the busy B end and um, the, the toy world end, we're pulling through there um, as we speak, um, which is basically going to get us up to the lights um, with those utilities being dropped in at the moment, along with the stormwater system there as well. We've kept parking available for those businesses as long as we can during the Haley Street project, uh, which I think was probably one of our smarter moves. Not not always the best ideas to, to take it out early, but I think we've tried to keep as much there as we can while we've been under construction. And I think that that's made a difference to us also. Just scroll down, Linnell. Um, just talk about our budget. Our budget forecast hasn't changed since my last advice. Um, we're currently tracking about probably about 2.4% over on Alfred Street, which is still 0.32% of the total project value. We'll continue to watch that as we go through. Um, we've had some overs and unders starting to come through. One of the things I said last time, we were not receiving um, larger impacts on materials when I was here last. I probably shouldn't have said that. Um, we're seeing that everywhere across the board now on every construction site. Actually, Aaron pulled me up. We got a letter on the November, and this is not just for KTP, this is right across council. All PVC uh, pressure pipes uh, will go up by 10% in November. Last week we were served with a letter. All PVC pressure pipes go up by another further 12% during December. So 22% raise on materials in two months. Um, we're seeing gravel go up. We're seeing everything go through. But what from our point of view is that we will monitor that and report that up as we go. So that's that's you'll know what I know. Um, at the moment, the, the good news is most of our PVC was ordered. Aaron actually worked that out. That would have cost us over $110,000 if we had not bought it we're probably wear about 10 grand um, but you can see that that's a huge impact but not for us but also for for Tim up the back that's that's everything so you can see 20 to 30 percent going across the board at the moment through construction which is just it's just too much money out there and uh, in, in supply and demand so um, but otherwise we're, we're tracking right on top of our budget at this stage I forecast that we'll be right on top of it and as that changes we'll keep reporting that every month so you know what's going on all right um, just go down for us please Linnell um, we talked about yeah, the price in, in risk and variations. I think our biggest one at the moment is weather, uh, to be honest. I think I just gave Luke the good news. It's supposed to be raining on Monday. They're talking 10 to 20 again. Um, I think everyone's happy to see the water go into the dams as we do, but when you're trying to build a, a large project, it's... it's um, but again, I'll, I'll credit to our team on, on the ground, particularly our supervisors up there at the moment. They're doing some wonderful work to mitigate the wet weather up there. We haven't had huge losses there. We had probably half a day where we've we um, the contractors knocked off and the guys had a half RDO. It was a bit wet up there, but they're doing work to make sure that they've got those stormwater pits open that we're draining um, water on site. And again, the quicker we move, the less less exposure we have to to that sort of wet weather. And particularly using the asphalt products instead of traditional road construction. If we were to build Alfred Street, um, you know, we're talking probably you know three to four weeks work there traditionally. Up in Haley Street, you'd be looking at you know probably seven or eight weeks at least through there, and we're going to knock that out in probably um, eight or nine days. So um, that that's a huge risk mitigation for us. Um, but yeah, good to see the weather. But we'll, we'll essentially again, we, our plan is to try and wrap up as much of the civil works as we can by the end of November, and that way we're not exposed during December for as much time. So um, 
just down there, consultations. Again, the, the staff have been out with the councillors, uh, which is um, very much appreciated, um, giving updates to all the businesses. All the businesses will carry, they, they continue to carry an updated construction program in there. They issued a new one this week, so every business knows what's going on. And as that changes, um, obviously we, we give a, a, um, a revised, revised program. Um, we've had a few come through just probably inquiring about what December and January looks like. Um, and obviously King Roy Street is probably the, the biggest one there where people are starting to see us getting close to the corner. Um, so we've started having preliminary conversations inside that as well. Just down to the last one, I um, just last photo for me, Lonell. I didn't touch on this last time. I left it there this time as well. Um, that's the florist up at um, Harley Street. I love the sign. If you read the sign there, um, for a business to have that out. They've, had it, they've left it out for probably two or three months now, I think, uh, for everyone to see. But um, I think that's it's fairly timely about what we do here at Council in particular on that project. So uh, well done to the business. And, yeah, it does put a smile on the projects team when they walk past up there to go and deal with some Telstra issues and whatnot. So, But uh, that's me, Mr Mayor, if I may. Thank you, General Mayor. Just a uh, um, little bit of nice to note the report for information. Do we have a mover for that? Thank you, Councillor Friday. I've seconded Councillor Jones. Um, okay, go to speakers. Councillor Potter, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Look, great job, and I look forward to them laying the asphalt there down. I like to sit down there and have a, co have a coffee while I watch that work. I'm just looking at this map here of the road closures. Now, when we did that community consultation, Councillor Shoemaker and myself, it was mentioned to us that the driveway that Coppards use and the, um, the framing place use down beside Busy B um, needed to be accessed and open and I'm just looking at this map and it doesn't seem to be will that be the case will they be able to still access that driveway thank you yeah with that one um, councillor if I might I might give that back to the project team to answer I know they were talking about that with the businesses through there um, and I believe they had been to Coppards for a discussion around that access it obviously will be closed for a period while we pull the AC through there there is a new driveway being installed. Like all businesses, there'll be a time there probably where we'll have to close that access to pull the footpath through. Um, but Luke and the team will be working with them. I'll just follow up when I get back to make sure that that's been dealt with, if I may. I believe it's in hand. Thank you. Thank you, um, Project Manager. Councillor Shoemaker. Uh, yeah, thank you for the report, um, Manager Mann. It was excellent. Uh, and certainly I'd like to echo your thank yous to Luke and Christy who are doing a lot of work on the ground talking to you know, and having very constructive conversations every day. Um, every business in the CBD has Luke's mobile number saved which is pretty extraordinary. So thank you. They're doing exceptional work and some of those conversations are tough um, and it's just been a, an absolute pleasure to work with them. So thank you. I just wanted to point out on page 32 under the budget, um, I'm sort of paraphrasing here, Council's increase in the cost in Alfred Street largely relate to the project methodology and efficiency on the early stages and subgrade issues resulting in an increase in asphalt for compaction. Council's engineers have redesigned the remaining pavements for subgrade stabilisation prior to asphalt, which significantly reduces the risk to pavement asphalt works, which will also um, prevent construction time losses. And I see on page 33 you've sort of explained that a little bit further with um, the redesigning of pavement to reduce the risk of uh, subgrade within the CBD uh, and go on to talk about um, a layer of cement that's treated base material installed prior to the EME2 asphalt um, which has resulted in a, in a variation in cost which is favourable, which is excellent to read. Just... Um, in relation to that work, I just wanted to understand, like, it's excellent work. Is there any changes to the longevity or life expectancy of the pavement um, through this process? Um, any, any learning, you know, anything we can expect? Because that is quite a reduction in cost. So I just wanted to ensure we're still getting the same outcome. Thank you. Yeah, three, Mr Mayor. Um, great question, actually. Um, so... What we did was when we went through Alfred Street, we had to throw in an extra 90 mil of um, EME2 because the subgrade was too soft through there. When we went through and did the pavement design, the, the material is actually not too bad, but what happens when the construction traffic loads it, it pumps. Um, and what you see is 
like every I don't know what it is. Every town in in Queensland must be built on a swamp or a water table. Um, I've worked every CBD job you've worked in that there's water underneath the drains. Um, a lot of the ergon stuff is the trenches are full of water at the moment. So what we did was when we opened that up, we ran into construction trouble straight away. Once we started loading that with with trucking, um, so we had to put an extra ninety mil of EME2 through there. That cost us about $60 a square metre in, in additional cost. So what we did was we went back and retested on Alfred Street and on Haley Street. And the Haley, Alfred Street's not too bad, um, but we're still going to put some CTB through there. So when I say CTB, I'm talking about cement treated base, so gravel with um, cement in it, which we buy from a local quarry, which you use on dig outs and those sort of things. Up in Haley Street, the stuff is underneath there, which we knew from the start is, is absolute rubbish. Like it's, it's just, if you've been up there, the black soil stuff there is just, just pug underneath King or Roy street. We don't have any of those issues cause there's already a full depth pavement there. So we won't get stung for a variation. What we looked at was two options to lime it, or we could go through and put CTB and then put the asphalt over the top. If we put the CTB through there cost us about $35 a square meter. Um, if we were going to do lime, it's probably going to be close to almost equal. But the thing with the CTB, um, it seems to work that it, like it's as hard as a rock like you've been down there, like it's as solid as, plus we don't drop lime into the CBD, which causes a dust issue. And, and it has a risk to the asphalt too that if we um, have to do a second run, then we would be up for $70 if that makes sense. So we've got to be a little bit careful. So the pavement life is almost equal. Um, to what our original design was. EME2 is stronger, um, but because it's down low, it's essentially a working platform. So all we're trying to do is get cement treated base through there so it can take the weight of the asphalt machines to come through. And the original design will still go through, so that'll still have a 25 to 30 year design life through that pavement as well. And when that basically comes out of its life, um, we'll go through. So I might be still working here at that point, we'll see. Um, we'll go through and we'll put a new asphalt top on it, same as what we would do on every estate. So that's why we like the asphalt. Normally, the, the traditionally, the granular pavements, gravel pavements will last longer than asphalt because asphalt has a life of 25 to 30. But when you're using CBDs and those sort of things, it is the, it's the right horse for the course, if that makes sense. Um, it's quick, it's fast, it's cost effective, and you get your return on your investment. So uh, so to answer your question in short, I hope that explains this. this so there's, we've looked at three different options. We've come at what we think does the best return on investment. We still will cop a variation for that CTB, but we're not walking into a $60 a square before we stern up. So we've tried to be a little bit smarter this time. But um, it seems to be very effective up there at the moment. So happy to walk anyone through the site too if they want to have a look at that when we're doing that. So feel free. We'll be doing the same on Alfred Street this week. You know, thank you for the explanation. And I just think it you know goes to the core of council, I think, learning and problem solving on the ground. and coming up with solutions and trying new things is really important. And I was really pleased to read that. And yeah, thank you for the clarification. It's great to know that we can have that outcome, but it's not going to actually impact the end of life of the infrastructure. So well done to you and the team. And um, I look forward to a walkthrough when they start next week with Councillor Potter, definitely. Anything further? If not, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Carry unanimously, thank you all. Thanks very much, Project Manager. Ex excellent work, thank you. Okay, 6.3, Kent Street, Kingaroy Street, and Haley Street, Kingaroy Footpaths. Uh, that's at 35. Acting uh, GM Manager Darcy, we might let you give us, a re give us the uh, run through on the report if you could. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. It's, it's as simple as uh, our resourcing didn't allow us to prepare this report in time for our, um, uh, for our cut-off dates for our reports, and we're requesting that we prepare the report for next month. We've started work, but we're just not finished. And it's one of two similar reports this month. Thanks. Thank, thank you, uh, Acting General Manager. So the recommendation is that the report detailing Kent, Kingaroy and Harley Street Kingaroy footpath projects be presented to the December Infrastructure Standing Committee meeting. Do we have a mover? Yep, Councillor Jones, second, and Councillor Froloff. Okay, uh, any questions for our manager or acting general manager on that? If not, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour, carry unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you, our many, uh, acting GM and uh, and manager. Six point four heavy vehicle routes, Kingaroy at thirty six, um, and uh, again, uh, acting GM, we'll go to you and to, to manager Darcy. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this item is uh, one that we have been working on for a couple of months, um, if actually probably longer in all honesty. And this is around trying to assist with uh, heavy vehicle movements in and around Kingaroy, um, but with a still a broader view in the background of how we actually move um, heavy vehicles through our region in general. Um, particularly in Kingaroy, uh, we, we do have some interests around uh, trying to connect the highways and the main roads traffic to their destinations. You know, we're talking key, um, key destinations that are very significant to our industry locally, um, predominantly PCA and Swickers traffic. And how do we move them from the Diagula Highway and the Bunya Highway primarily um, to those sites? Uh, we do have some, some short-term items around construction in the CBD as highlighted earlier, but at the same time, it's around needing to address a holistic view on how do we actually get them uh, across to those other sites. So at the moment, we do have a detour in uh, around the southern side of the CBD to assist in, in bringing that heavy vehicle traffic in through uh, Somerset Street, Alfred Street East and Jarrah Street to connect them into up to Haley Street. And then um, what that does is actually take that via PCA and then also ultimately out to Swickers uh, as well along Haley Street. Um, but what we are also trying to do is look at uh, some of the strategic interests around that traffic that comes from the north. That is not the most efficient movement of, of traffic and particularly in relation to Swickers, they do have a reasonable percentage of traffic uh, that is of interest to them that comes in from the north. So to bring them all the way through uh, town to take them around the southern side of town and then to basically go you know, circumnavigate the CBD to go out on the eastern side, um, there's, there's possibly other ways that we can look into this. So we are looking at um, you know, wanting to work with main roads in this regard because they do uh, hold the keys to their state controlled network on how we get some good outcomes from our, for our community there. Um, but we also need to try and navigate our own network in to support those outcomes at the same time. So there are some key interconnections where we can get onto the council network, but also how do we get off the council network and back onto the state network. Um, so looking to uh, yeah, work with TMR, also interested in, in working with our uh, portfolio holder, Councillor Jones, and how do we uh, you know, look to progress this item. So looking at having a workshop in the near future to assist with this um, and also just to bring uh, council up to speed a bit more with the detail in the background um, because it is quite a, um, a significant item to, to talk about. So I'm happy to take any further questions if, if council has any more. Thank you, Manager. So uh, the report, uh, the, the recommendation is that, that we note the investigation of the heavily trafficable routes within Kingaroy has commenced and a workshop is currently being developed and will be delivered to discuss these options in detail. Do we have a mover? Councillor Jones, thank you. Second to Councillor Potter. Okay, questions? Uh, Councillor Potter, thank you. Um, thank you, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, there has been a lot of issues with regards to the heavy vehicle traffic using Edenvale North Road, turning the corner, going up Harris Road and then coming down into um, Clark and Spencer's. We've had a lot of community... Um, a lot of our community members are upset because of this. The trucks are wrecking their driveways. The trucks are wrecking our corners. And I'm just wondering if we're doing something when we're discussing the the, the, the routes, whether we should actually go to our community as well because they've got, believe me, they've got a lot to say about this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pella. Yeah, Manager. Manager, um, yeah, just on that issue of that... That's, that traffic coming from the southern end through that uh, yeah, section. What are your thoughts there? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Potter. Uh, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, the Diagula Highway is, is a key route that comes into Kingaroy from the southeast, and obviously that destination, it's Wickers, um, albeit there are approved routes for, for B-doubles um, under the relevant legislation. Uh, we do have some rat running that occurs in and on the fringe of Kingaroy as well. Um, that route is, is not under permit nor gazetted for that operation. This is around operators uh, taking the path of least resistance, um, given that it's the shortest distance on where they want to get to. Um, I do believe it is a very few um, operators that actually are utilising that route. Um, 
and yeah, there, there are varying stories out there as to where that destination is act is actually leading to as well. Because um, you know, even though it is in the vicinity of, of their neighbours at Swickers, there there are some discussions around other sites in that immediate vicinity that um, may be of interest as well uh, that are overlapping with that larger commercial traffic operation in that area. So, yes, you're absolutely right. And to answer your second question, yes, we do need to liaise with the community. Um, I think once we can have our workshop and, and get a broader understanding on where we would like that traffic to go and, and have those discussions with main roads, ultimately we do need to go to the community and, and have the discussions with them as well. Yeah, thank you, Manager. Clearly important to engage with those community, with those uh, those residents on that particular pathway, that route. Um, so, so should that traffic, just remember, it should be going up Redmond's Road and then back down the uh, the um, Kingaroy Barkers, is it? Uh, is that the preferred route in terms of you were saying uh, the the permitted areas, um, as against coming all the way down to Edenvale and then up through Harris and uh, and Clark and Swenson? Yes, certainly, Mr Mayor. There are a couple of options available to Council on what we would like to do strategically. Um, where our key points of interest uh, are, are all util sorry, usually around the intersections. It is around the main roads intersections with the Council roads and what we can and, and can't do in those particular areas because these, uh, these trucks and their trailer configurations, some of them are very significant. Um, with the, ama the, the amount of footprint that they take up on the road to do those movements that they would like to do. Um, they do need a, a fair large amount of square metres and some of our infrastructure is just not large enough to accommodate those movements, particularly for the safety of other road users at those intersections because it is usually um, you know, your cars that are there, traditional residential traffic are waiting to do a turning movement and then they have a potentially a B-double come right across their nose and sometimes it's the second trailer that comes as part of that B-double that gets very, very close where sometimes those, those, those mum and dad operators need to do um, manoeuvres to get out of the way of, the, of those second trailers or they may need to apply the brakes because of the time in travelling along the road um, and that second trailer takes a certain amount of time to get across um, that path of travel. So, yes, we do need to look at a number of opportunities um, in trying to push those, those particular vehicles. Um, but at this point in time, uh, we need to probably be all on the same wavelength and, and understand Council's position in order to go and have that discussion with main roads. But you're absolutely right, Mr Mayor, that is... Um, one very decent opportunity we do have. Really a, a need to um, involve the uh, the residents in that uh, consultation that you refer to there on page 37. I think that's clear the message, Councillor Potter, would that be correct? Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, Manager. Councillor Schumacher. Uh, yeah, thank you for the report. I can certainly um, agree. There's certainly not enough room in that area to accommodate some of those movements. I was one of those vehicles actually just last week with a B-double that took me by quite a lot of surprise in that very area. So it, it is an immediate area a concern and something that we do need to focus on. So I look forward to the workshop um, and do believe we do need to take a holistic view uh, in terms of these issues. So just in relation to, I note, you know, in our resolution in September, um, we had moved that Councillor Jones be appointed to lead the strategic planning and advocacy with the department in relation to heavy vehicle movements, including road trains across the region. And certainly from a regional development point of view, I know that's an enormous inhibitor um, for many operators in our region. Um, and I guess as part of that workshop, my only request is just, it would be great to understand some of those historic issues around road trains and what our existing um, network actually allows for and where across the whole remit of the South Burnett we have truck and trailers decoupling and then going about their business coming back. Um, just want to really understand that where it does make sense to really advocate for those changes and um, put a st strategy in place that sees us achieve that um, because I know road trains um, in the South Burnett is, is an enormous issue for many of our um, industry partners and certainly from um, 
the diverse nature of our economy, it's, I think, important we put a plan in place um, to really set us up for the future. So I'd really like to understand where we've been, um, where those issues are, and, you know, if we can see that on some sort of large map or something, that would be really helpful from an advocacy point of view. Set Councillor Jones and our council and our region up for success in that view, is, is my view. So thank you for the work done in this space. I know it's not an easy <coughs> issue to resolve. Councillor Jones. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. And uh, totally agree, Councillor Shoemaker. The, um, I had a great opportunity while we are in Mackay to uh, progress these conversations and um, yeah, make contact with the uh, relevant people and uh, working with our staff. And I think we can get an outcome. And I totally agree. We, when we have that um, conversation and that meeting, workshop, we need to find out where we're going to go first and then we go back to the consultation. The only question I just want to clarify with these trucks that are running up illegally going up uh, Edenvale North and all that sort of stuff, Clark and Swenson, council can't enforce any restrictions on that traffic. Is that correct? Um, uh, Mayor, uh, to respond to the Deputy Mayor's question, um, I might start by saying that we have a range of vehicles, some of which are as of right. That's correct. So anything under 19 metres, so a truck and dog, a semi-trailer, um, uh, those vehicles are as of right. And James spoke before in relationship mm. to permitted vehicles and also the B-double route. So the B-double route is a prescribed route that's pre-approved. Operators can lawfully use it without a permit. Other routes they can seek. And obviously we're not going to be providing um, approvals through residential areas. So while we may see some lawful use, there may be some use which is not permitted and that is a matter for the uh, police service or uh, Department of Transport operators should they be operating in the area. That's correct. So that that's why this is a messy, messy situation and we have to get an outcome sooner rather than later. So we need to, and you guys are doing a wonderful job in organising that meeting and workshop and uh, look forward to that because um, I'm reasonably confident that uh, down the track sooner rather than later we may get a an outcome that's going to be suitable for everyone and, and Councillor Shoemaker is right. Because we can't get B doubles into our South Burnet, into the heart of our South Burnet, one business alone is having to spend an extra $200,000 a year on transport just to get his supplies to his factory. That's one, one business. So it is an enormous thing for regional development and everything. We've already lost a trucking company out of our region because of it. We don't want to lose any more. So I uh, fully support what the staff are doing. You're doing a great job. We'll get that workshop happening and um, I'm reasonably confident moving forward that we will get an outcome that's going to be suitable for everybody and, and everybody will be invited to come along to that meeting for discussion and whatever. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Okay, uh, we'll go to the vote on this one. Those in favour, carry unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you, Manager. 6.5 Project Management Framework Development Update, and that is at uh, 38 on the agenda. Okay, so we've got the report there. Uh, General Manager, Manager, would you like to take us through that? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this is uh, just an update for for councillors. I've actually got two reports, this one and the following one, and they're both uh, projects that we have uh, ongoing at the moment. One's the, the latter one is uh, a project that we're looking at uh, improving our maintenance in the, particularly in the sealed road space, and, and this one is in our capital space. So, looking at um, improvements that um, that we'd like to make um, in in our capex. So, I won't go through it in great detail, but there are some some key points um, that I'd like um, uh, like to just highlight. Um, our principal project manager, Darren Cunningham, he's, he's, he's the champion in this space and hats off to Darren for all of the work that he's been doing. Um, the, the project essentially is, is twofold. It's, it relates to the individual projects that we, that we deliver and uh, an attempt at trying to uh, improve the, the, essentially the project management of individual projects as well as the, the overall CapEx program that we're expected to deliver this financial year. We've got something like 50 projects that we're currently managing and 
creating a more robust uh, framework around around both the individual projects and the the program is is ultimately the the aim of of this. So so very quickly, there's a couple of key milestones that we've um, that we've um, achieved. Uh, one is uh, on the screen there. It's a, a, a tiered level for individual projects. So we've looked at acknowledging that a lot of projects are very different. There's some very high risk ones. Uh, KTP, for example, is is quite complex, both in design, um, construction, and community engagement. And then we have uh, some some. Uh, easier projects which which uh, we would term as tier three so uh, gravel resheeting is is a good example where it's it's quite um, a routine and there's, there's probably less uh, complexity to those sorts of uh, projects um, over the page uh, we've introduced or commencing introducing what we call a gateway system so there's five gateways in a in a project then it it um, essentially is identifying from the inception of the project uh, through to planning and design, procurement, evaluation, execution and the final uh, project close out. And so each of those phases in a project has some, some certain tasks that we need to tick off. And just over the page there's a, uh, that one's a pretty boring um, image, but it actually is, is a, a snapshot of the Microsoft project uh, software that we we use to manage our projects in our program, and uh, within that you can see the the elements of the gateway system where we're uh, looking at the the design, looking at the procurement, the construction, and the final completion. That's probably been a really big change for us this financial year. We have previously used Microsoft Project to manage our pro projects and programs, but this one is. Um, much more complex, and we're, we're working working through that, understanding some of the complexities. But it's it's good in terms of um, the overall um, management of the project. Understanding that the project doesn't start doesn't commence when we when we have our tools on the ground. There's a there's a lot of lead up pre construction work. And interestingly, the the final closeout of the the project. Uh, quite often, our teams are keen to to go on to the next one, but there's a lot of loose ends that we need to to tie up, um, particularly in the financial uh, capitalisation, etc. And that's um, uh, that f the the gateway system formalises that for us. Um, I won't go through these particular slides. They're um, they're a little bit too detailed. Uh, but they are for for council's information. Um, that that one there, Linnell, That uh, we presented this about twelve months ago, I think. And uh, so this one is is an update on on where we're at. Um, we've substantially have the framework around um, uh, around this, and there are the the, um, uh, the training, uh, some resourcing, and um, uh, as well as looking at other uh, particular uh, improvements such as mobile apps to, to get some of our um, uh, uh, crews to, to input um, uh, some of the project data. Uh, so there's, there's still work to happen but it's substantially um, progressing. So a bit of an update there. I think, um, I think we have a timeline on the, the last slide. I think that is, yep. And they're the various phases, and we might, might be a little bit behind um, that that particular time frame, but we're certainly into phase four, and um, and in some cases phase five. Thanks very much, manager. It's a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, okay, so we've got that presented uh, for information committee. Do we have a move for such, Councillor Schumacher? Second, to Councillor Jones. Thank you. Do we have questions, Councillor Schumacher? Uh, excellent presentation. Love the gateway system and a huge congratulations to Darren and your team. This is really great to see the progress that's been made. Um, my only question is just around the system in itself and my apologies, I'm sure we probably went over this um, when you first presented it, but just keen uh, to understand, you know, has our team 
uh, designed this gateway system themselves or have we taken learning from another organisation and kind of plugged them in and um, I guess massaged them to meet, meet our needs? My question. Thank you, Councillor. We, we certainly haven't reinvented the wheel here. We've, we've taken learnings from, mm. uh, from, from other, other businesses and other councils. So, yeah, definitely um, not uh, a, a bespoke product. Oh, it's fantastic work. Thank you. I um, It didn't look that way and I really enjoyed reading through the presentation. I love the tiered system and the gateways um, and it's great to hear. I know how complex Microsoft projects can be so no doubt uh, I see you 50% there with your training but I imagine that's no doubt an ongoing um, focus. So well done and thank you for sharing. It's excellent. Uh, thank you, Manager. Councillor Duff. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just wanting to know on um, where you've got the establishing the capital project hierarchy, gateway one identification concept, identified project need, identified the proposed needs, improved engagement with stakeholders. So is that something, because I, I did talk about this, I raised it when we did our communication strategy and um, communication um, policy. Um, just is that something that the councillors would be involved in at the from the in the beginning to understand the level of the you know the importance of the project and whether or not it needs you know what what level of community engagement would be you know desired uh, yeah very much so councillor in fact the the gateway one is 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 probably the most involvement that that councillors um, uh, would have um, identifying the particular projects and and ultimately the the, the budget um, to proceed. Yeah, thank thank you, Major. Further, Councillor. Thank you. I'm just I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, I'd imagine that some of these will be underpinned by policy, um, Manager. So, for example, if we looked at stakeholder consultation in Gateway Two, as the third element there, committing to establishing stakeholder conference with engagement reviews of expected scope delivery that that would be underpinned by our community engagement policy anyway, I'd imagine, yeah. Um, yeah, and look, very keen to hear more about the uh, the use of new technologies in terms particularly the acquisition and of data out in the field, getting that back into the system uh, centrally from the workers out in the field. Uh, apps and all sorts of options are available today, so very keen to see you move away from uh, any manual work, any pen and paper technologies uh, into some of the newer options. So clearly that'll be an important part of the system moving forward. Uh, yeah, overall just uh, keen to um, um, encourage you to keep up the great work. Yeah, thank you very much, it's an excellent report. Okay, well let's go to the vote. Those in favour, carried unanimously. Thank you again, Manager, Manager Searle. Okay, 6.6, .6, the Road Maintenance Management System Update, and that's at page 50. Uh, we'll stick with you, Manager Sill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just an, another project that we have, uh, and we've probably been working on this uh, since since last year. And it's uh, it's an improvement project, and it's aimed specifically in our ma road maintenance area, very much so in the in the sealed road maintenance. Um, the the report is twofold, so it's an update on on how we're progressing with with that, and we previously reported on that. And there's, there's also some commentary uh, towards the back of the report, which looks at, um, there was a request to, to look at Toowoomba Regional Council's practices and so forth. So I've provided some, some commentary through there. Um, very, very quickly, uh, uh, can you just scroll back there, Linnell? Uh, that's it, uh, I won't go through, through that in detail, but um, it's uh, essentially looking at uh, some of the key uh, milestones that we've completed uh, in those little boxes there and one of the big ones is the the loading of our reflex software and and that's um, substantially being used by our crews now which is which is great uh, our current focus uh, just scroll down there for now that one there uh, there's there's probably three little boxes that uh, that we're currently focusing on one is the the, the start of the uh, the defect capture and the, of the process and the, uh, our routine inspections and also looking at our, our defect prioritization and uh, developing our uh, program uh, for delivery um, 
in terms of our the latter one, the delivery of prioritised work, one of the the uh, uh, the new uh, achievements that we've we're currently trialling is is a zonal system for our maintenance crews, uh, similar to the unsealed space. Uh, so we have about twelve uh, areas uh, in the region, and uh, the essentially the the trucks will operate um, within a zone, and then they'll move on to. Th the next zone and so what that is doing is this seeking to minimise the the amount of reactive unprioritised uh, work that we're doing. Um, just uh, next next page there, Linnell. Uh, scroll scroll down a little bit. Um, so so reflect the software system. We're getting a, a lot of data out uh, of uh, on our network and and ultimately that's going to provide us. Uh, some some positive information to make better decisions on that network, and there's an example pie graph there, and and again on the other page, um, and and that's just looking at the types of the types of uh, the work that we're doing and um, the percentage breakup of of that work. But there's probably going to we're probably going to find a lot of information that we can pull out of the system. Uh, just a, a quick commentary on the, the sealed road surface improvement. So, so probably two two items in there. We're currently trialling a uh, an asphalt product. Uh, it's a commercial quantities of this asphalt. Uh, it's got branded Easy Street. It's quite expensive compared to our our normal uh, cold mix product. It does have um, benefits. Uh, it's probably more long lasting, more enduring. Um, it does come at a cost, and so there's uh, currently a, a bit of a trial that we've had going for the last few months, and, and we'll look at uh, the various uses where we should, where it's economic to, to use, where it's beneficial to use, um, as opposed to the the commercial to, to the uh, to the normal standard premix that we would would use. Um, and the other the other improvement there is our zonal system, which I've previously mentioned, uh, which is um, I think that'll be a, a real a real benefit once uh, once we once we trial that um, and get all the bugs out of it and um, so yeah it's just uh, some some uh, some improvements that we've currently got on the on the um, on the go at the moment. The next page there is is some commentary around comparing Toowoomba Regional Council with uh, with our council and some of the practices there. Um, won't go into to those in detail, but the but in summary, what we found is the systems are quite similar uh, to what um, to what Toowoomba Regional Council are doing. Uh, technologies and practices um, are, are fairly similar, particularly the zonal system, which which we started to try. Um, Toowoomba Regional has access to hot mix, which is a benefit to them. We don't have that access um, on a on a maintenance, a routine system. We'll, we'll and so we're trialling uh, the various products such as Easy Street. Um, one of the differences we found was the the um, that Toowoomba Regional Council probably has uh, is better resourced in terms of the the planning scheduling function, and this is a, an area that we've previously addressed and is a big focus on where we can improve. So what I'm talking about is um, the effort that is required to, to look at all of the literally thousands of defects, prioritise them and come up with a uh, pragmatic um, program to, to go and fix, fix everything. So, um, and that's a big focus at the moment with our, with our maintenance improvement system. Uh, the last slide there, we've got a, a, a bit of a time frame on where we, where we, when we commence, which is way back in January 2020. Uh, we rolled out the the mobile software um, back in September and uh, November, all the way up to July. And from July this year, we've had essentially a soft implementation of our of this uh, Reflex system, and we'll be trialling that over the next next 12 months or so and um, be improving and changing things as we go um, and, that, and that's um, 
that's essentially it. It's it's um, I'm I'm quite um, quite positive about um, the work that's going into this. Still have a long way to go. Not definitely not perfect, uh, and um, but um, you should see some improvements um, um, over the over the coming time period. So thank you. Thank you, Manager. So the recommendation is that the committee note the attached report on road maintenance management system update. Do we have a mover? Councillor Potter, thank you. Seconded, Councillor Jones. Councillor Duff. Um, three, Mr Mayor. Um, just a question. Um, uh, I did ask a, a while ago on a report on pothole and programs and the option of doing big and small potholes together. And I noticed that um, on Wattle Camp Road and also Edward Street, Wandai, we've done some potholes but not all of the potholes. And it, to me it's reputational damage because people can't understand why we're doing that. And I've had... You know, complaints continuously and I just wondered where that was at and I know Councillor Henshin talked about it too to do the two have the two teams working together rather than just doing the small potholes or the big potholes at different times it just it's a bad look for council and hard for um community to understand why we're leaving the potholes so I just wanted to update on that one thank just, you just to refer to that manager um would that be something that would be would it would it uh, would be reasonable to consider as part of the zonal approach to maintenance moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I can't comment on Edward Street specifically. But happy to, to look at, um, at why some potholes may have been left and others others fixed. Um, there may be a, a quite a logical explanation to that. Happy to to do some research on that. But um, but but certainly. Um, uh, it, to an average person, it, it makes sense to go and fix all the potholes in that particular area. So, um, so that's one of the things that we'll be looking at um, uh, addressing those sorts of issues. Onto with that, Councillor. Uh, um, just wanted to supplementary question. So, is it true that at the moment we do that? We have a small pothole crew and a big pothole crew, and we have separate crews doing the potholes and that is why that is happening and we're going to try and do it, change that process or as part of our zonal system or is that something that I've got wrong as far as the big and the small? So we have three uh, purpose-built machines, uh, two pave lines and, and a flow-con machine. They do... Uh, uh, use different materials um, they all fix potholes um, one uh, the flocon is is more adept at the the, the deeper particularly the deeper uh, potholes um, so if there are if there are particularly severe potholes then then I wouldn't expect our pave lines to be to be addressing those um, Acknowledge that Flocon machine can't be in every single zone at, at once. Um, there is a there is a um, uh, a program, um, and there there is there is only so much that a particular Flocon machine can do. So it's not always practical to have them going going having two machines going around together. But certainly there are there are cases when when it would be very much appropriate for them to be doing that. Is it um, happy with that response or? Well, may I? Uh, and could, uh, to to my, my understanding of the council's question is there's there's three crews: the two pave lines and the flow con. So there's been some specific issues this year, and I think uh, when you raise it, we have both pave lines went. No offence to black cats out there, but someone ran over a black cat because we had both pave lines went down mm. fairly close to each other and that has disrupted a lot of... Now, I, I can't... I'm not going to speak broadly, but my understanding of it, Kevin, was that there's um, cooperation and coordination between the different crews for that exact issue, but we did have a lot of... Um, through no fault of anyone, just mechanical failure. Well, when I say no, just, yeah, black cats. But we ended up with a lot of kit down at the same time. So it has disrupted some of those programs. So I'm not sure if that 
maybe those ones that you're specifically talking about because I was aware there was an example that went out because the one machine was able to do some work but the other machine was broken and it couldn't go back and finish off. So partly it's that communication of that I, I suspect is part of the problem when the machinery is down. But if, if that assists as well, there was some considerable difficulty this this calendar year with, um, and particularly one period, I shouldn't say the whole calendar year, but you guys will probably know better than I, but there was particularly one period where we did have a lot of equipment trouble. If... Um, th thank you, um, to you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, but this was only last week. So the first one was, was Sherberg Road, complaints about the fact that we did small and not big or vice versa, and then that was a while ago and only recently, just last week, a complaint about the Edward Street and Wondai in particular doing some of the potholes and not all of the potholes. So whether that's just there's still machine breakages and things, I'm not sure, but there's a fair bit of space between those two particular concerns that have been raised with me. Yeah, more than happy to, to have a look at um, Sherberg and, and Edward Street. Um, uh, yes, we, uh, CEO is correct. We have had um, some significant uh, breakdowns. We've had two, essentially two thirds of our fleet uh, broken down. So we've had to, um, over the last few months, had to uh, to go and hire machines from from other councils to to keep um, to keep the work going and um, to um, to get potholes fixed, etc. So that's had an enormous impact on, on what, what our normal routine uh, is. Um, I, I, I just clarify in terms of um, the having the two machines running around to, together, um, that's, um, that certainly is, um, uh, there are certainly opportunities to do that, but it's not going to be part of the the norm, if you like, uh, on the basis that we essentially have two pave lines and one flow con. So, as I say, you, you can't have the flow con everywhere doing the larger patches. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, if that's the case, then I think we need to educate the community that, on what we're doing because I think that it's causing reputational damage where we're seeing the big potholes done and the little ones not done or vice versa. And it's been going on for a long time and I just think that at some point we need to, to just declare that that's what we do and so the community understands what's happening because I'm finding it difficult to explain why we're doing what we're doing. No, I acknowledge that. I'll, I'll do some research, uh, particularly Edward Street that's that's been talked about, as well as Sherberg Road, and I'll provide some information on and some clarity around around that process. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Jones. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. Take all those points on board. Councillor Duffy's right. We've had conversation. Councillor Henson's raised it, and we did have a conversation around trying to work them together, but... Uh, as has also been tabled here that um, we had major breakdowns and all that, but uh, I just want to put it into perspective. If you want to give the uh, give the people of our region a good answer, councillor, and I believe that you were the one may have asked to compare with Toowoomba Regional Council. Toowoomba Regional Council has 3,000 kilometres of seal roads within their network. They own one jet patcher, two pave lines and six flow contracts, and they have approximately 140 Frontline sealed road maintenance staff. South Burnett has 1,400 kilometres, two pave lines, one flow con truck, and approximately 30 frontline sealed staff. So if we doubled that to get up close to the 3,000 kilometres, we would only then have four pave liners, two flow con trucks, and 60 staff maintaining the same amount of road. And I can assure you, I can stand here and hand on heart and say that the Toowoomba Regional Council gets slammed for their maintenance on their roads as well. So you put that into perspective, we maintain the same distance of roads by doubling up what we have available to us, we're not even close. We're not even close and we're trying to maintain a road network with that stuff. So if we want to improve our work, we have to resource it. How do we do that? That's my question. So there's your answer to your community. We just have not got the facilities or the resources to get to where we want to do. And I, I agree with you. The, it's, we, 
I get slammed all the time. What do you got a bloody truck out here doing the big potholes? They're driving no little potholes and all that sort of stuff and that. Not arguing that, but the figures are right there. So when we compare us, this is a prime example why we shouldn't compare our council to other councils. The figures are right there. Even if we doubled it and added 10%, we're still not even half of what the resources have for Toowoomba, and they still can't deliver their services suitable for their ratepayers. So it's, it's, it's right there in the comparison. So just one, that's a pretty good explanation for your people out there. Let them know how our staff are doing the very best they possibly can with the resources they've got at their hands. So I'll just leave it at that. Councillor Schumacher. Uh, yes, I absolutely agree with Councillor Jones, and I have to say in reading the report, there's also additional information there, Bobcat profilers and asphalt attachments, which we don't have access to as either. So I think it is pretty impressive when you look at the fact we're maintaining 1,400 kilometres of road with 30 staff and the machinery that we've got. And um, I guess I just wanted to come to uh, your points um, Manager Searle, just around the efficiencies to be gained in the planning and scheduling resources. So you mentioned that's a big focus for you, the maintenance system and you know, I can see the excellent work that's happening in that space. I just wanted to understand, so at the moment, with all these customer requests, so I've looked at the reports today, it's pretty extensive. You know, we are receiving an extensive number of requests still around road. So with all those customer requests, and all those defects in the system, um, and I know raising them all the time and you get the message back to say thank you for logging that, it's been logged. How many people have we, how many boots are on the ground in terms of planning and scheduling our um, you know, two pave liners, one flowcom truck and our 30 frontline staff? How many, how many people are actually coordinating that work um, inside your office. I'd like to understand that. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Linnell, if you just go back to page 52, just up the very top. That's it there. So, so that little diagram there was uh, a representation of, okay, we get all of our defects, whether they're through customer requests or through our own inspectors, we compile all that and the, uh, the team there, the coordinators, our supervisors and tech team will uh, look at all the defects and um, uh, prioritise a, uh, an appropriate program. So, so you, you end up with a tech team as well as the guys, um, the guys that are more associated with, with the teams out in the, in the, on the ground and coming up with a, uh, a practical uh, program. Um, in terms of numbers, we have uh, two dedicated inspectors and a, a, works overseer, a, a, a works engineer that sits over them. And then we have our coordinators and supervisors for the 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 sealed team and the general maintenance team i'm talking uh very much in the sealed road space which is which is where the the uh, the focus is at the moment so we have two inspectors one works engineer and co coordinators and service supervisors across our crew of 30 people uh, that's correct um so so we so part of the tech team, we, we also have a, uh, 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 an engineer, a works engineer for our corridor management. Um, and we also have a principal engineer that sits, sits above them. So that's, they're not solely focused on the sealed road maintenance. Um, so so I wouldn't suggest that they're full time in that um, sitting over the, the the 30 outdoor staff. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. I just think, you know, it's it's incredible the amount of um, inquiries that are coming through the door and the defects raised regularly. And I know the challenges in terms of keeping on top of those. And I guess it's important to just remember, you know, how many people are actually sitting there processing these and trying to, to work out a 
plan to efficiently dispatch our resources and get the outcomes that we need in our community. And, you know, I, I just think the report was excellent and being able to just see some of, um, you know, the work that's happening around uh, the challenges with hot mix and things, I, I absolutely agree. I think there's more work that needs to be done in sharing this story with our community and the facts of the challenges in which we face. Um, final question, just in relation to that hot mix. Where do we actually get our hot mix from? I thought it was the Darling Downs, but I just want to confirm how many kilometres does, on occasions when we are actually doing hot mix works, how far does that have to travel? And, um, some of the logistics around that, because I imagine you've got to keep it at the same temperature as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. KTP is probably a good example. So we're sourcing hot mix, both your standard AC hot mix as well as the special EME. It's coming um, from Toowoomba, um, and and they they will generally um, uh, have to keep um, the the hot mix to a um, uh, to a particular temperature, and um, and quite often the the trucks are have their bodies heated. Um, we we would we would source we would very rarely source. Uh, asphalt for for maintenance for smaller patches we have done in the past uh, we've done a particular patch on Youngman Street where it was not considered appropriate to use cold mix because of the uh, enduring nature of um, of using cold mix on heavily trafficked uh, roads so um, so where where there is um, where there is a, a larger program of of um, of asphalt required for maintenance, we would certainly consider. But as a general general rule, it's it's probably too far uh, for us. Um, probably too uh, cost prohibitive. Um, more, more than anything, I would think. Um, in comparison with Toowoomba Regional Council, uh, they, there's an asphalt plant in pro in close proximity. So so why wouldn't you use that? Um, take advantage of that. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Um, I just think, yeah, there are certainly, I'm hearing you in terms of those planning and scheduling resources, and I guess as we look at this into the future, and I know future budget conversations, I think we really need to you know we're doing this structural um, organisational review, but um, it's important that, you know, to get the outcome on the ground, you've got to have enough people um, actually planning it. Uh, and I just really want to understand... Um, those barriers and ensure that we are actually setting our teams up for success. Uh, certainly recognising the heavy burden that they carry with the amount of requests that they're receiving and the challenges in dispatching the resources that we have. So thank you for the report. Okay, uh, Manager, just a couple, if there's no further from councillors. Uh, the jet patcher that they use in Toowoomba, can you give us just a quick overview as to its role? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. The, the jet patcher is essentially another uh, brand of what we call a, 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 an auto uh, pave, so essentially the same as a, a pave line machine that we have. Uh, we actually, previous council previously owned a jet patching machine. Uh, we replaced that uh, with a pave line machine. So that essentially they perform the same function, which is um, using emulsion and aggregate to, to fill in potholes. Thank you. The, um, you noted here that Toowoomba have three schedulers and planners, and just further to Councillor Shoemaker's question, those staff that you mentioned, so who physically does the scheduling and the planning? Which of those officers do that work? So, so probably refer to to the the screen there. So it is it is very much a, a team a team effort uh, in terms of the the program. Uh, we have um, we have recently um, had an additional uh, staff come from from in, into our area, um, uh, rediverted into our area to focus on, on uh, programming improvements in the maintenance space. 
um, and, and that uh, particular person's doing a wonderful job um, in terms of uh, those sorts of improvements. But it is very much a, a, um, a team exercise in terms of ensuring that we have the tech team as well as coordinators and supervisors developing um, those that, that program in collaboration. Thank you, Manager. And just one final question, and we will need to wrap up quickly. Um, the f keen to see as part of this process, as Councillor Duff was saying, and Councillor Hinchin has raised, whether we can work with the team to see if we can maybe find some, uh, get some better outcomes with lining up that one flow contract with at least one of the pave liners, so that they then we've got a crew of a pave liner and a flow con that move together, if that can work. Now, I know it won't work 100% of the time, because you're not always going to have the profile of work that suits that, but if we can try and maximise the extent to which that truck and that pave liner are moving as a unit, I think that would help address a lot of the issues. So whether we can sort of start to look at that with the team, have that conversation with the team would be much appreciated. Okay, let's wrap this up because we do have an issue, um, a maintenance issue in the building. So uh, first of all, um, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Carried unanimously. I'll now move that we adjourn the meeting at 10.30 a.m. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Schumacher, those in favour? Carried unanimously. Meeting, meeting adjourned. We'll close off. Thank you, Lynette. Okay, uh, I'll uh, move that we reopen the meeting at 11 a.m. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Jones, thank you. Those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you all. We're at 6.7, which is audit process and tracking of costs for RMPC and RPC at 56. Uh, Acting General Manager, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And this, uh, th this brief report uh, is similar to the early one. We just didn't have the capability within the week or so time frame that we have between the general and the uh, closing reports, but we would uh, request that we can bring this uh, back uh, to the December Infrastructure Standing Committee with your uh, patience. Thank you. Thank you, Acting General Manager. The recommendation is that uh, Council note this report and that the report detailing the requested information be brought back to the December Infrastructure Standing Committee meeting. Do we have a mover? Councillor Henshin, thank you. Second, Councillor Duff. Uh, those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you, Acting GM. Uh, item 6.8 Camping facilities at Cumbia and up grade to Apex Park can be found at 57. Uh, over to you. Thank you, General Manager O'May. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Yeah, so this was in response to a, a query at a previous Infrastructure Standing Committee, so that's why it's come back to the Infrastructure Standing Committee uh, today. So yeah, the team have gone through uh, looking at, this is the looking at establishment of a camping ground uh, at Cumbia, uh, and so looking at the, the reserve land over the backs of the uh, of Cumby there, um, so yeah, the report just details. So this is just really high level preliminary investigation. So there's been no detailed scoping or, or, of done. So it's just that initial preliminary of areas and the estimates that indicative costing of where what sort of things you'd be looking at, so the amenities, the dump point, um, effluent disposal. So yeah, so um, listed through the costings there. Um, the issues with the the uh, parcel there, the, the land tenure is, so it is reserve land, so it's not freehold land for council, so it would be a, a matter of ne um, negotiation with the state government. We would need to do, we suspect, a land land management plan for, for use of the reserve land. Um, so, yeah, so th that that's really the, yeah, the operational way, but yeah, the, the initial cost is what we've, we've been asked to bring back um, estimate around forty thousand dollars a year ongoing operational maintenance. So if we have a, a campground set up there, then you're looking at your, your, your cleaning cleaning costs each each day. The dump point disposal is if we put a dump point in a facility in a town that hasn't got sewage, so you've you've got that issue of you've just got to collect the waste and it'll be um, when, when it's full. You've got to transport it. Um, through to a sewage system, so um, you've got that gas refills, just general ground maintenance. So yeah, as I said, these are these are initial um, estimated figures. So there hasn't been detailed scoping or anything done, but um, that was yeah where, where we thought we'd need to bring this back to, to council first. One um, one of the f concerns we did see um, is yeah, it's just trying to get that land management plan. Um, 
approved by the state for use of the of the of the reserve land. But yeah, I'm not not sure if there's any questions that council had or what the intention of council was with in relation to this. So we just thought we'd provide some information to, to generate some discussion. Thank you, uh, General Manager. Uh, so the recommendation is that uh, the report be received and noted. Do we have a mover for that? Yep. Councillor Potter, second to Councillor Duff. Uh, okay, so questions, uh, comments? Councillor Henshin. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yeah, just um, not so much questions. I'd like to bring it to the Chamber's uh, attention that this has been talked about in Cumbia and, and we know we've got many uh, entry points uh, to the South Burnet and Cumbia is one of them, pretty important part of the South Burnet. We're 80 kilometres from, from uh, Dolby, which is the next major town. Bell, of course, has a wonderful little spot there. Um, just yesterday at the Melbourne Cup, uh, a wonderful initiative was taken by the committee there. They, they used the ground, which was private land next door, and they had 19 caravans parked there that came to the Melbourne Cup in Cumbia yesterday, and there was more caravans parked down in the CBD of Cumbia, if you can believe that. At uh, Apex Park there, was several were camped there, and of course they have uh, our wonderful stone fruit growers that accommodate an enormous amount of caravans and casual staff there. So this is something that uh, certainly on the table that we can look forward to discussions and um, and I know there's a lot of work to do in this space. There's an enormous lot of work to do in this space but um, would be a, a great benefit to the little community of Cumbia and the South Bernard if something can happen here in the future. Uh, Councillor and, and General Manager, would it be fair to say, just looking at the costings there, $272,500 including $105,000 um, estimated for the amenities, the toilets and showers. Would it be fair to say that the toilets and showers may not necessarily be required, that we could establish a camping ground uh, without those uh, and take that cost and also ongoing cleaning and maintenance costs out of the equation? Would that be uh, something that could be considered? Yeah, three, Mr. Yeah, so, well, certainly that's just a service level requirement, whether, whether you provide... Um yeah, showers and toilets, it's certainly um, a big attraction for those free camp sort of sites that, that there is. Um, yeah, showers and toilets there, but yeah, that, that's really just a... It certainly would be a big big cost saving. Um, I, I guess my understanding is that, and I could be wrong, but that not all, but, but many of them now have their own internal toilets and showers in their RVs or in their caravans in the modern era. So whether that's something we might be able to consider just to mitigate the cost... Uh, just, just probably putting that out there at this stage, yeah. Okay, Councillor Schumacher. Um, thank you. My question, just in relation to land tenure, so you mentioned the land management plan, um, GM OMA, and I just wondered, what what is the actual process for that? Like, what does that look like over a period of time? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so because it's a reserve land, so we're the trustee of the land, so there's the state is the ultimate owner of the land. So if we were trying to get approval to establish a, a caravan park there, then we would need their approval. And, and the process generally, that was what they'll be requesting is, is a land management plan is how, how the land will be managed. Um, there is certainly risks associated with that. So they might look at whether they may not approve the use of that land for, for that purpose, particularly say in Cumbia, if there is, there is another facility there that offers commercial um, you know, a small commercial caravan park site. So that's one of the risks where um, the, the state look at it. If you are competing with a commercial business, if we're establishing a free camp site in a town where there is already a commercial opportunity. Um, so, yeah, we do see that as, as a risk that the department may not sign off on that. Um, there is a, a lot of the free camps that are established across the board don't have approvals, and it's really just that they're historic and this issue hasn't come to a head and, and been up, but if you go and try to legalise and establish a new one, going through the process, um, yeah, I do see that that will be a, be a risk. Being the case, um, obviously we'd want to work closely with the current commercial operator at Cumbria anyway, I'd imagine, and make sure that they're involved as a stakeholder in the process, uh, and may, they may be prepared, I don't know, to give some form of consent or support depending on the circumstances. Um, Councillor Jones. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, I just... Look, I, under, I understand it, it's, it'll be good for Cumbria and all that sort of stuff, but 
at the current time, these caravans have the ability to go up to the race course and all that. Now, I'm not 100% sure, but Councillor Henson might be able to uh, clear some uh, concerns up for me. Uh, whether or not they pay a camping fee or anything like that to the facility up there to... Um, because that facility that I saw yesterday out there was... It's going ahead in leaps and bounds. Now, that money, if it was going into that sporting precinct um, and we take them away... Now, again, we have a service station that also has a uh, commercial caravan park at the back of it. We have a hotel and a butcher shop. I think they're the only businesses in Cumbia at the moment. So by, by doing this and putting these facilities down there, and it's already been touched on as far as the service station proprietors go and whether or not they would be supportive of it or not, I don't know. Again, are we taking an opportunity away from the sporting precinct to have uh, income to... I, yeah, I just... I understand what the uh, presentation is, but I, I just have some concerns around that. Now, if they go and camp up at the uh, facilities already available to them, it's not that far from uh, from the town centre if they want to... And normally they want to go for a walk or whatever, have a look, they go to the pub, go, they drive down and get their fuel anyway. So I'm just wondering or not whether or not it's... Um, yeah, we need to do a little bit more work, and I think Peter's touched on that as far as working with the uh, owner of the service station and the land management that Councillor Shoemaker has addressed. And, um, yeah, certainly not against the idea, but I just, I just think there's a few little hidden problems in the whole, whole idea at this stage, yeah. Councillor Potter. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Yeah. Um, look, I probably agree with um, Councillor Jones at the moment, um, but, but if we look at the Sport and Rec plan under the Cumbia 4 one, it says, as an alternative to um, Cumbia 3, consider relocating the overnight motorhome and camping to the sports ground. Um, which would be suitable for the sporting clubs. But I'm starting to agree that after seeing yesterday at the Melbourne Cup at Cumbia, which, by the way, was a fantastic day and they did a brilliant job, um, I'm sort of thinking that maybe we should be having talks with all of these particular community organisations so um, we can actually maybe put the owners back on them and they might be able to do something in this space as opposed to us doing something in this space. Councillor Shoemaker. Um, for me, I think it's good to have this sort of level of insight so we can start to really think about um, what the future looks like for the Cumbia area. Um, my biggest concern is Apex Park, and it's great to see these renewal costs here um, around the turf and renovating existing structures, the bollards, the signage. You know, those bathrooms at Apex Park are, t are terrible, in my opinion. Um, and certainly I think it's amazing. I go to the Bunyan Mountains quite often, how many people actually camp there overnight um, in those facilities. But the, the playgrounds really need some urgent attention. Um, and I kind of think, I see here you've noted that further possible works may alleviate the perceived risks to separate vehicles and pedestrians is to seal the car park and install bollards. Um, estimated cost of fifty to sixty thousand. I see that as like the first immediate priority, and I see these two issues as interconnected. You know, we either need to make the decision to, as per the sport and rec plan, to establish another facility at the sports grounds, or, you know, renew the facility we have. Um, my concern really is around the families for Cumbia and actually providing them with a playground. Um, that's suitable for those young kids um, in a place where families can connect and be, be a part of their community. Um, and so for me, Apex Park really is the priority and I understand we, we really need to decide whether it is an area where we want to allow overnight motorhome camping or whether we want to shift them elsewhere. Um, and when it look at that overnight motorhome camping, I know there is significant, you know, economic benefit and I've been in arguments either side. You can argue either side of the case, whether they're good or they're bad for your community. Um, and uh, there's supporting facts for both sides, to be honest. Um, so it does make for a difficult decision. But I do think, you know, looking at partnering with those other groups like the showgrounds and those facilities to try and 
to help them um, may be a better option. Um, my focus, by all means, I would, I would love to see us, if we had $200,000, to spend that on Apex Park um, first and foremost before going and establishing another facility we have to maintain in the area. So I guess I'm torn. It's great to have this sort of level of insight and context, and I think we need to... Um, you know, I know we've gotten some great feedback from the Cumbia Streetscape Works and it was wonderful to be in Cumbia and to meet with some of the residents and talk about that. Um, I think, yeah, I think we need to have a... To flag this, it's an, it's an ongoing conversation and I think we need to really think about um, what works best for the Cumbia community. I'm also really mindful of that little stop on the edge of Cumbia. It's just got like a, a seat and a tank on it. And, you know, whether there are opportunities for overnight stays to transition into those sorts of spaces so there was more space available in the park for the intention of a park. Um, I don't know. I'm not, not sold. It's great information. Thank you. Um, and I think, yeah, we need to engage our community out there and, um, and I know if the sports ground is something that they would like, I guess we, we need to... Um, clear in that before we sort of go forward any any further with these discussions but thank you for the context around the project it certainly puts it into perspective councillor jones yeah thanks mr mayor just quickly i <coughs> excuse me i fully support councillor Jumaker and what she says that uh with the um proposed work to do the uh, upgrade to the uh, main street of cumbia uh that would be the missing link if we upgrade the main street and leave apex park sitting there as it's uh currently uh, presented, I think it would be a uh, a uh, blur on um, our, us as councillors and um, not finishing the project. Like we say, um, if we're going to do it, we do it once and do it properly. So I think I fully support that we do that Apex Park. And I'd like Councillor Henson's uh, view on this. I've also been around when Councillor Henson's been talking to some of his uh, constituents out there in Cumbia that a truck stop just out so to get the trucks outside. Maybe that's something else that we could look at and and coincide with that, so yeah. So I fully support Councillor Shoemaker's comments around the Apex Park upgrade and they have facilities already there currently that um, can still maintain and provide services for those motorhomes as we progress and, like I say, not, not against it, but just at this stage, I think Apex Park is a priority. Councillor Henson. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yes, to confirm, Councillor Jones, the caravans are... There is three entities in Cumbia. You have the Rikers Fuel Station with the caravan park at the back. You have the Apex Park and, and they are encouraged to go up to the sports ground and they pay a fee when they go up there. The caravans that were at the Melbourne Cup yesterday, they were encouraged to donate into a donation box. And let me tell you that they did and did generously. Those people that were there also on the afternoon before, which I was fortunate enough to be involved in helping set up the stalls there, those, all those people there were helping as well volunteering just to help to get the day done, so credit to them. I think another thing we, we just want to um, touch on as council, you know, we really, we, we're going to create another asset, and as Manager O'Mey has stated, that could be a possible $40,000 a year cost to council to maintain. We have assets now we're struggling to maintain, and we've got to be very wary of what we create in our asset portfolio, that's for sure. But um, yeah, Apex Park is certainly, with the likes of Streetscape, it would be great to see that upgraded. And, and, and to touch on the, the parking facilities for trucks, I spoke to the stone fruit growers over the past couple of weeks and it is just absolutely astounding the number of freight companies and transport companies and trucks that have to park. They unhook their B-doubles down in the facility in the centre of Cumbia or on the outskirts near the primary school there. They have to go up to the orchards and load and come back down and shuttle that's becoming a little bit of an issue with time frames and noise. They're cold rooms, they're cold fridge fans, of course, on the back. But uh, the numbers of those transport companies that are in Cumbia with that strange fruit season, uh, when the season on, is absolutely absorbent. It's, it's incredible. It's massive. I don't think people are aware of that. It's just what goes out of Cumbia. And that's just one. I could imagine Black Black with the avocados would be enormous as well and anywhere else that produces that sort of product. Product. So, um, yeah, as I said before, a lot of work to do in this space. Apex Park is, is seriously popular. Uh, it's, it, its facility is a great facility that is in desperate need of 
revitalising, and that's for sure. If we do a streetscape in Cumbria and we leave that on the corner there with some softball in those uh, kids' playground, uh, it would uh, be detrimental to the look of, of that streetscape. And I think, as Councillor Jones said, as with all our projects, I'd like to see this council, when they pull on these, these um, contracts or, or, or these improvements, that we do it once and we do it well. So we're not going back there and people say, oh, well, we didn't do the park or we haven't got a facility for trucks or something. Uh, and the list goes on, I know, and there's never enough money for it. But I think we look hard at this and, and work hand in hand with the community and, and all your fellow councillors and their managers to see we can get the right result. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sanchez. I'm, I'm going to wrap this up, um, councillors, um, because I'm conscious of time. Um, I'm wondering, just in terms of, of, of moving this forward, whether there would be appetite for the committee to put uh, through a motion along the lines of the community, um, uh, the sport and rec plan KU3 and KU4 there um, to propose that we engage the community to collaborate on the redesign of Apex Park and to consider relocating the overnight motorhome and camping to the sports ground and to consider options for, uh, for, for uh, pa uh, truck parking transport parking bays. Uh, that would then pick up the three elements, Apex Park, camping grounds at the sports fields, and that. Is there appetite for that? If there is, I would uh, perhaps seek someone to move that and then we can progress. Okay, Councillor Henshin. Um, so if, if I... So we'll just, yes, so we'll knock this one off first. Thank you, Mr. CEO. So, so just on that, um, so we've got the, the recommendation um, that we, we note this report and uh, detail the request may be brought back to the count infrastructure committee meeting. So, um, hang on, have I got the right one? No, sorry, no, I've lost my. So the report be received and noted. So let's do that first. Do we have a? We've got a mover and a seconder, have we? Yep. So we'll go to the vote. Those in favour, carried unanimously. Um, just want to see if we can get a good outcome here. So, so then, um, Councillor Henshin, your thoughts as the divisional councillor on a motion that addresses those three elements. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'd certainly like to move the motion that we take into consideration the upgrading and redevelopment of, of Apex Park in Cumbia, along with uh, following that, along with uh, and with consultation with our stone fruit growers and the community out there in relation to a truck park um, for heavy vehicles. Yep. Uh, so that all ties in with the completion of the Cumbia streetscape. Yes. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, just perhaps in that truck parking bay, the truck uh, decoupling and parking bay facilities. We've, and I've mentioned that because that was mentioned in the in the uh, facility out at Jurong some time ago. Because that's what they do there. They decouple and go uh, up to the orchards. Okay, I, I don't know that we'll necessarily want to spend a spend, put a time frame on that because we are coming up to Christmas. I don't know that we're going to lock ourselves in. I'm sure that's a body of work that can be done as part of uh, over coming months. Uh, are you happy if we just leave that open at this stage for the staff to work through that process? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think yeah. that's, a, that's a great start. And, and I would expect, um, Mr. Sia, that that'll involve um, the uh, the divisional councillor and um, and the portfolio holders, Jones and and Duff, um, in that process. Yeah. Okay, so, so we have uh, Councillor uh, Henshin's motion there. Do we have a seconder? Okay, yes, Councillor Jones, thank you. Uh, all right, speakers for or against? 
Councillor Shoemaker. Just a question. I just, I think we've passed a motion in relation to Apex Park recently around the design of Apex Park, further to the um, Cumbia Streetscape plan. So. It was Sorry. discussed. I feel like it, it may have been in the. Um, yeah, I could stand corrected, but uh, Apex Park was touched on. And it wasn't part, and correct me, Jones, uh, Apex Park's not part of or wasn't mentioned in any of our streetscape plans. It was mentioned as a separate article as such. Yeah, yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, councillors. Okay, we're ready to go to the vote. Happy with that? Okay, we'll put it to the vote. Those in favour, carried unanimously. Thank you all. Uh, moving on then to 6.9, options on grading Wheeland Street Highsville at 59. Uh, Acting GM and Manager, thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Uh, this uh, report is in relation to Wheeling Street in Highsville, and we've looked at some various options for maintaining grading Wheeling Street. Um, traditionally, Wheeling Street is a, a 200 metre section of unformed, unconstructed road reserve that in, intersects on the, the Prost and Wondike Proston Road. And, um, Linnell, if we just scroll scroll down a bit and just have a look at that uh, for context. So that's Wheeland Street there. You've got um, uh, Wondike Proston Road and then and that 90-degree um, bend is, is essentially Wheeland Street. It's uh, uh, quite a narrow laneway there, 10 metres 10 meters wide. Um, and that's the, uh, that's the particular road that we're looking at. Um, so we've looked at some some various options. There is a little bit of a concern with using a grader, and there's some some pictures of Wheeland Street there. As we can, there's I think there's three of them there. And now we can scroll through. Um, request was that we put the the Wheeland Street onto onto the patrol grading circuit. Um, so that was one of the options we looked at is um, uh, utilising the equipment. Uh, Essentially, a patrol grader and a and a water truck through there. Concern is that it's quite narrow and it's probably not not going to be a good outcome to utilise utilise a, a grader. Uh, probably um, smaller equipment such as a backhoe or a bobcat might be more appropriate in this particular case. If council was minded to uh, commence uh, road maintenance on Wheeland Street. Um, I've essentially ended up, uh, in terms of the recommendation, falling back to Council's policy, the the uh, construction of unmade roads policy, where we, uh, for example, if we have a, a section of road reserve that's currently unmaintained, that we would uh, seek to, to have either the, um, the applicant or Council uh, upgrade to a four metre uh, gravelled uh, Road on top of a six metre formation, and um, and essentially that forms the recommendation that uh, once that's constructed, then um, then we would seek to to maintain that. Um, that would that, that's the recommendation if we if we wanted to do if we wanted to do things properly uh, in essence uh, uh, in terms of maintaining the, the road. Um, an estimate there is is in the order of forty thousand dollars and. Um, uh, the recommendation is that perhaps we consider that in as a capital project for next financial year. Thank you, Manager. Okay, uh, Councillor Duff. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to, <clears throat> to move an alternative recommendation to the one that's on the books here. Put your motion forward. Thank you. That the committee recommends to council. The council upgrades Wheeland Street Heisel. To unsealed gravel road standard. Through inclusion in council's 2021-22 capital works program. And that Wheeland Street Heisel is added to Council's road maintenance program. 
once. The capital once the capital upgrade has been completed. Okay, as presented there, Councillor, are you comfortable that that's been um, yes, thank you, recorded Mr. correctly? Okay, do we have a second of a such? <laughs> Councillor Potter, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Duff, first opportunity to speak, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. So I did send through, and I was requested to send through on the 12th of October, some um, two emails which I had flagged previously and they haven't been included in the, in the report. I'm not 100% sure why they weren't included in the report, but one no, was... Oh, sorry, Councillor, just to answer that very quickly, they had a whole heap of personal information through them. The infrastructure did attach them to the report, but given the nature of some of the details, contact numbers and things, they were just dropped out of the report because this is in public domain and we weren't going to share the personal information. That's all. But that being the case, Councillor, any uh, information that is shared here today in public domain, can we please keep that um, anonymous? Um, Mr CEO, keep that anonymous in the interest of protecting the public, uh, members of the public involved, if we could. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so, so one was from a former um, CEO of um, the Wondai Council. Just um, so it's in our liberty to read that out. It's just about... Uh, it's in. It was in preparing preparing the agenda. I mean, we can easily circulate them to the council. The one that was the one that was definitely attached to the report had um, individual information, like personal information, and in address, phone numbers, and things like that. The opportunity to um, cull all that out and, and sort through the email, by all means, absolutely table table the email and the content in it. But just yeah, I was. We were just very conscious. Oh, I was. I'll take it. it was an I, not a royal we. Was just very mm -hmm. conscious of the of the personal information for the parties involved. Yeah, I think so. so that being the case, councillor. Yeah, um, feel free to share that um, at the committee in the committee meeting now. Um, but I would just caution you to uh, keep the um, uh, obviously in relation to any any residents. Uh, keep their uh, let's let's keep them their details um, uh, completely um, uh, private if we could. So happy, happy to share broad statements about the circumstances that people find themselves in, but let's keep the name, uh, address and so forth of the people concerned are private. Can we do it that way? Uh, yes, Mr Mayor. Yep, thank so, you. So the first one was from an email from um, the, a former CEO of the Wandai Shire Council, referred to your query regarding whether maintenance work was carried out on Whelan Street High School by the former Wandai Shire Council. Mm -hmm. My association with the Wandai Shire Council was from 1965 to 2007, 1965 to 1968 cost clerk, 1958 to 1975 deputy shire clerk and 1975 to 1993 shire clerk and 1993 to 2007 chief executive officer. As a cost clerk, I was responsible for costing of council capital and maintenance roadworks during my time as shire clerk and chief executive officer. It was my responsibility to ensure all requests for the upgrading and maintenance of council roads was carried out. Written and councillor road requests were dealt with at monthly council meetings and I can recall that councillor um, Bill Etherington, who was the divisional councillor for the Highsville area, had from time to time requested that maintenance work, including grading of roads in Highsville, be attended to. One of those roads was Whelan Street. I hope the information I've provided will ensure that Whelan Street is included in a list of formed roads. So I got that from um, yeah the former CEO of the Bondi Shire Council because I was I have been told that if the roads were uh, graded in previous council that they were regarded as formed roads. And that was was the thing that made them either unformed or formed was whether we'd done previous maintenance on them. So then the other one is that there's a lady who lives right down the bottom end of Whelan Street and she has a medical condition and she has written, sent me actually a copy of a doctor's letter stating that um, <clears throat> about, about her, um, her diseases, diabetes and kidney problems. And she, the, he stated that the address is not in the Google Maps and it's very hard for ambulance service to get access when in an emergency as it took about one hour to find the place and besides the road can be very boggy after rainfall and the wheels stuck in the bog and they'd be, he'd be most grateful for our support in this issue for it's life-threatening when the ambulance cannot reach this lady on time as she has multiple common as attached in the health summary. So there's a health summary there of all of the issues that this lady at the bottom end of Whelan Street faces. 
And that's where it was raised with me in the very first place was this lady right at the bottom of Whelan Street with her health conditions and, yeah, well, actually life-threatening conditions and so that she has obtained a letter from a doctor. So that was just the two that were um, I had sent through on the 12th. So I just really keen to – I just wanted to, because of – like to wait till uh, the next financial year, I think if, if we are going to do it that we should do it now because of um, that's been the issue is, is the lady at the bottom end of um, Whelan Street with her medical condition. So I just wanted to flag that and see if we can – Bring that forward as opposed to waiting till 20, 22, yeah, the next financial year, 22, 23. Thank you. Do you, Council, Mr. CEO, anything to add? Not just uh, it's Glenel, we need to add in the committee recommends to Council there. The other thing, Mr. Mayor, and I'm probably going to be um, particularly after um, recent, so to last meeting, we, we quite rightly sent one of these with a budget amendment through to the budget review, the second quarter budget review, and um, without me being too bold, but this would involve capital upgrade and it would probably need to be fed into the second quarter budget review. If I do believe we're going to be working through that throughout the course of November in terms of our capital program with uh, w, uh, LRCI, W4Q. Um, that'll probably pick up as well some of the CapEx uh, programs as that will all get packaged up and folded in to one big CapEx program involving those different funding sources throughout the course of November. Um, so that could be, if Council had an appetite to resolve this, it would have to be folded into that process, uh, as Mr C has articulated. Um, thank you, Councillor. Okay, let's go to other speakers. Councillor, Councillor Potter. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Just a couple of things, starters. Is the road um, signed and also is it possible for us to to um, send that road details through to Google so it's actually included on Google Maps because to me they're, they're really too easy. It is on Google? Well, I don't know why they couldn't find it then. It's a really good question, Councillor. Um, manager, General Manager, process for getting these roads listed, Mr CEO? Okay, I can answer the, the sign one because this one's come up over several years as, the, as some of the councillors would be aware. Um, it is actually a gazetted road listed whilst it's unconstructed, unformed, depending on what language you use. Um, one of the, and actually, and, and please, the, the personal medical information, if I may just reiterate that, that was involved in that email, that is exactly why it isn't tabled in a, in a public forum. Um, the the, um, the sign, the, there's a gazettal with a, with a street name. Uh, the sign was put up approximately two years ago. We had one here, I think Councillor Froloff as well, we had one here in town that was in a similar circumstance and we put both signs up at the time. Um, yeah, so it is It is normally, um, not normally, where it's not named or a name's changed, the guys send it through to Department of Natural Resources and it feeds through. Google can be notoriously unreliable as far as marrying up its data to the official NRM land records, but um, all that, it is a gazetted road that is, well, is gazetted and unformed, unconstructed, depending on what language you want to use, as in the photos indicate its condition currently. And that's just a statement on its current condition, not on what it should be or shouldn't be, um, with the signage. We have had the sign uh, <laughs> removed. It's been replaced a couple of times. This one is, is very topical in memory because of, um, of, of that. Uh, and there was another property that's at the beginning of it. I would stand corrected, but I understood when they put their entry in on the road corridor, they effectively built their own driveway into the road as well. Some history there, yeah. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Uh, okay, Councillor Shoemaker. Uh, just a couple of questions. So, um, with the road, it seems a little bit more like a, a laneway. Like, is it possible to change whilst it's gazetted as a road? You know, I'm just thinking about my relatives um, live in Benarkin and uh, they're on Scott Street, and there's a laneway directly behind them, which is convenient when you're trying to back your caravan into your um, shed, uh, but, you know, it's largely not for, not used, not maintained by council. So I just wanted to understand, is there like a, a road hierarchy here where this level of road, because it doesn't seem like there are many people who actually live on this, other than, 
this lady, are there any other residents who live on Whelan Street, like in terms of actual residential houses? And does she have, is this the only access to her property or is there another road? Oh, my mapping skills are terrible, sorry. So I'd just like to clarify that. Is this the only access, is Whelan Street the only access to her property? Is it really a street or is it a laneway? And are there other people relying on this street um, that would quantify, you know, actually forming the road? So my three large questions to start with. Uh, thanks, Councillor. My understanding that there's three uh, dwellings on that um, particular street. Um, I think one of those lots has is associated with a, a lot on Wandai Proston Road. Um, so there may be that alternate access, but um, but certainly for the the resident down the end, and the uh, there's there's two houses that we can see on one of those first images. I believe that's their that's Whelan Street is is their their access um, in terms of um, the differences between laneways and and, and streets. Um, um, it, it probably is more appropriately termed a laneway, but in terms of the the access requirements, uh, it's essentially whether it's a laneway or a street. I don't um, I don't think there's a uh, much of a differentiation. Um, a lot of the road reserves within Highsville are around about 20 metres wide. This one's um, half that width, uh, 10 metres wide. Um, yeah, so it is it is. Uh, probably more uh, correctly termed a, a laneway. Thank you. And just um, in terms of Hivesville itself, you know, looking on the mapping system of the, of the town, it seems like there are a number of unformed or... Is this the only unformed road in the Hivesville sort of village CBD area? Or, um, actual residential area is probably my question. Or... Are there others of this nature? I would have to take that on notice. It's, it would not be uncommon to have a number of road reserves that are unconstructed, unmaintained. Um, it, it actually quite common um, in, in most, most areas. Um, if, if there's no need to, to construct a, a road reserve, then, then obviously we don't, we don't do that. So just my final question, in relation to Highsville itself then, um, obviously there's been subdivisions and things happen over time and what seems to be apparent is that there were no, there was no infrastructure put in place when those subdivisions were approved or it just seems like a long-standing issue. If this dates back to 60s, um, GM OMA, perhaps you can provide some clarity here but I'm just curious, like in terms of our responsibilities as a council, like by all means, if this lady needs to access and you know, should have right to access um, an ambulance like any other person, I absolutely agree. I just, yeah, probably want to understand, like, is this a much bigger issue when we're just getting a little piece of it? And, um, you know, for the Hivesville community, I'm mindful, you know, I've been in Blackbutt and I know there's a street out the back of Blackbutt that's, um, you know, um, unsealed gravel in the centre of town. I guess I'm just trying to get my head around how does this sort of situation happen and um, would there be no planning requirements or something? Um, is that how we've ended up in this position? I guess I'm trying to understand some of the history. Yeah, thank you. Through you, Mr. Yeah. Yeah, so essentially it is a historic um, issue. So as we're aware, if someone makes a planning application at, at the moment, uh, a subdivision application, we would have the conditions and, and we would condition that development to the standards that we expect of that development today. So back in, the, and, and this one I could say would potentially predate the 60s, so um, the standard of a subdivision in the 40s might have been just a cleared track or whatever, I assume. that they're, So that the time for conditioning developments is at that time when the lot's created so and that's where as a council as an authority we we accept that those 
those roads um, are as they are, as, as they're formed. But this is what the council's decision is, is the standard of, of service, whether we provide a, uh, a clear access, whether we a gravel access, whether a sealed surface and that. So, but, it, but unfortunately, the, the historic, how they come around, and this won't be the only, we've seen it across the board, um, where the historic subdivisions. Um, we have tried to address that through the planning scheme with those ones, like the memorandum situation, and um, where you we actually try to put a, an overlay over there so you don't get buildings already or new stuff getting created in these areas, but where there's existing um, houses and that already on there, then um, it, it really is what it is at the moment. Yeah, th thank you, GM. Councillor Jones. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. And like Councillor Shoemaker has highlighted, uh, GM uh, May, uh, Ylampa Road, Staines Road in Blackbutt, uh, there's one out off Ellesmere Road that uh, we had issues, one at Dangor Mountain that's right across. Councillor Duff had one a couple of years ago out there. That road, to me, I've had two phone calls from people living down there. I've had one meeting uh, in, in the lunchroom there with a gentleman that lives on this road, and that was the reason, probably the instigator of why it was we put the sign up. And another person that rang not concerned about the road surface, but about their driveway into their property. And the, all he wanted, the bloke was asking, and Councillor Duff brought it to me and brought it to the chamber and said, he just wants a couple of loads of gravel or a couple of buckets of gravel in his driveway. He wasn't really complaining to me anyway, as far as the road surface. Now, those three photos there show me that I, I would struggle to see a vehicle struggle to get up that road because that is very, hard compaction there to me. And I'm not. I'm happy to be corrected, I don't live there and I haven't driven it in the rain, but that surface looks very, very compacted, very hard. But the issues that I've ever had raised with me always come down to the driveway, the actual entrance into their property. One gentleman asked for it, he said, all it bloody needs, mate, is a couple of buckets of gravel and all that sort of stuff. Just He said, it's a swamp in front of my driveway and I can't get in and out when it rains. Nothing was ever mentioned about the road. So again, this is a and totally get what Councillor Duff has brought to the table with the letter from the doctors and all that sort of stuff, but is it the road surface? Um, she mentioned, the, um, the councillor mentioned that uh, it wasn't on Google and that was at emergency services, but I believe that it's been proven that it is on Google. So, yeah, I just don't know. I'm, so that's the information, I'm only going on the information I've received and the conversations I've had with two residents who live in Whelan Street, so, yeah. Okay. Uh any other councillors which to contribute before we go to Councillor Duff for right of reply? Just quickly, Councillor Shoemaker. Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Just on the information that's been provided, I'm I'm not going to support this today just based on the fact I actually need more information and more understanding of what other roads of this nature and I guess a broader plan in terms of if these are genuine issues that residents of the region are experiencing. I don't want to cherry pick Wheelan Street over another street. So I guess my concern is if I support this today um, without having been in the area or the actual information, you know, around, um, without more information, I, yeah, I can't look at that bigger picture. And, and so it's by all means I'd like to rectify the issue, but I think as GMO May has said, this is a historic issue. We've got a number of these across the region. And I actually think we need to take a broader brush view of all of those and um, actually hash out a plan in terms of how we fix them. I think cherry picking roads because we've received letters just doesn't align with um, our strategic focus and certainly stretching our resources. So I recognise this is an issue, would like to do some more work on it. I'm not going to support it for the Capital Works Program until I have some more information and we've actually had a look at all of these problems across the region and hashed out a bit of a plan in terms of how we rectify them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, councillor, any other councillors? No? Councillor Henshin, no? Okay. Um, all right. Well, well, hearing the comments there, um, it's my understanding uh, from what I've heard that, that uh, is it correct to say that it is on Google? The ambulance can find? So the ambulance can find the property? Okay. Well, that, that's certainly comforting to know. Um, the, the, there is only one point of access for the lady who lives at the end of this street, um, the lady to whom Councillor Duff has referred. That's my understanding, and that this, this Whelan Street is the only way that she can get in and out, the only way that the ambulance can get in and out. Um, 
I would hate to think that that street became deteriorated through the predicted rain that's coming up over re over future months to the point that she couldn't get in and out or the ambulance couldn't get in and out, um, particularly if it's washed out down into the drain uh, leading onto the highway. Um, and there is rain predicted. Um, and, and, you know, in light of the doctor's comments, uh, I would certainly not want to be responsible for a situation where access caused her harm. Um, and for that reason, I'd, I'm certainly um, prepared to support the motion as a one-off example, a case, sorry, of where there's mitigating circumstances involved with an individual's health. Um, so that's a position I'll be taking. Um, having said that, Councillor Duff, let's wrap the debate up. Right of reply. Thank you. Yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, could I just make a quick comment? Or ask yeah, please do, Councillor Henson. Please Mr. go Mayor. ahead. Um, Wheel and Street, could I just ask our team, does it not join, go through to Ten Chain Road? Could that be a question on notice, perhaps? It does. Thank you. There is, I don't, yeah, anyway, that's Ten Chain Road. Okay. All right, let's go. Right of reply, Councillor Duff, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, um, these people that live along there, I mean, they pay rates. I believe that they are entitled to access. I think that it's a, it, it was, that was always my understanding in the past that if you could, if it was graded or looked after, and, and currently I'm pretty sure that it does get, um, even the Parks and Gardens guys do work down there. So to me, it's just a matter of whether it's formed or unformed. I believe it's a formed road. It should be a formed road. But the people who live along it, as I said, they pay rates. They went there, live there. Some of them have lived there for years, believing that, that, that they are entitled, the same as everybody else, to have the road maintained by council. The, the, um, it's in the middle of Highsville. It's like we're not... We're not. I, I hope we're not living in the third world, like that. Highs will segregated from the rest of the region. I just think that it's the very least that we could do is to ensure to those people who live along that that council will maintain it. It's to me, it's a. It should be a formed road. We've put a blade there. It's this is ongoing. I have had, um, and over the years, and I'm sure, um, councillor, um, the deputy mayor has had issues, Councillor Henshin, it just goes on and on. It's only, and when you talk about an just their access, that is part of Wheeland Street. It's around the corner there where they want a couple of bucket loads of um, gravel to stop the bogging that the lady is, that the doctor is referred to. So as the Mayor has said, I'd hate to think that we just left that go and it got boggy with the rain that's coming and we and they couldn't access it. So. To me, I just can't see why it's so hard for us to ha to just go, well, yes, it is a formed road and, yes, we will maintain it because, as has been said, it's not that big a deal. It's only a small amount of gravel and, at the very least, I think we can do that for the people of Heisel. Thank you. OK, let's go to the vote. That concludes the debate. Uh, those in favour? OK, Councillor Duff, Councillor Otto, those against? Councillor Jones, Potter, Ahenshin, Froloff and Shoemaker. So the motion has been defeated uh, five votes to two. Thank you, Linnell. Okay, thank you all. Councillor uh, Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to move a motion um, that a report be brought back to... I'm going to say the May Standing Committee meeting. Detailing all unformed roads in the South Burnett region that have been report um, that have existing residential landholders. who have made inquiry to council in relation to road maintenance. So further planning can be undertaken 
to consider these issues. Okay, please confirm, Councillor Mack, you happy with those presented? And has got that correct. Yes, I believe that's in line with the intent of my of my previous comments, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so thank you. We have the motion there. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Froloff, thank you. Uh, Councillor, uh, speak first. Councillor Schumacher, thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Based on the conversation we've had, I think it's really important that um, we actually look at these historic issues and uh, give them careful consideration. And I'm mindful that our capital budget only extends so far and of Council's previous um, policy move in which was to um, not form unformed roads. Uh, but I, I guess I just think as a council, we need to understand these and understand if there is some work that needs to be done in terms of, as has been identified in this report, um, other levels of maintenance that perhaps council need to consider into the future. Uh, I'm mindful this, this is clearly an issue, um, but I, as I've said, I don't support picking off um, projects um, without seeing that bigger picture. And I guess I'd like some more information and to lean in on this noting that there are many historic developments of this nature in our region. And, um, you know, I think to be fair, Councillor Duff's absolutely right. Ratepayers are paying money and um, paying rates. And if there's a way in which we can plan and strategise um, to solve some of these problems, uh, I'm certainly supportive of it. So I guess I would like some more information. I'm saying may because that's in the lead up to our um, budget discussions and I understand the extensive work the team currently have on the on their plate. So that's my view. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Other speakers? Councillor Jones. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. I'd like to ask Councillor Schumacher and Councillor Froloff if they'd consider adding a uh, another part to it in regards to Wheeland Street as it currently sits, if our staff could go out there and just maybe have a look and see if there's any concerns around the driveway access and all that sort of stuff off, if there's bog bog issues as Councillor Duff has requested is. So if we put part two, if they wanted to um, just go and not do the road, but just check to see if there's any real issues or bogging or anything like that immediately on the side for their driveways, because that's the issue that I had reported to me. It wasn't the road, it was the driveways into their house. Um, I, I think, I don't disagree with that as an action, but I, I don't think it really in aligns with the intent of this motion, um, Councillor Jones. And I guess my concern there is in terms of driveway access, every landholder, it's my understanding, every yeah, landholder is responsible for their own driveways. Yep. And I've had plenty of experience in um, Division 4, which explain, <laughs> experiences significant um, drainage issues when there are um, significant downfalls and had to have that very same conversation with mm. a number of constituents who live in my division whose driveways are impacted by um, rainfall and they've had to fit the cost of actually maintaining those because they're responsible for that infrastructure. So I understand the intent of what yeah. you're saying and certainly um, you know, I, I understand the challenges, but I guess in this instance, if we've held a firm, no, and I've got elderly residents just the same with very similar issues who have had to um, fix their own driveway. So if this issue pertains to the neighbour, um, to this person's driveway, I believe it's their actual responsibility, like every other ratepayer in the region, to maintain their own driveway, and unless I'm incorrect in that assumption. No, but I'll give you that one. One to you. Yep, I'll yep. accept that. Yep. I know, Good. because it's a very topical yeah. issue in my I've division, and yeah. I've done a lot of groundwork in that space. Yeah. So um, it, it's, I guess, my intention here for this motion, I understand Wheeland Street um, in, an, in another sense um, and the intent of what you're saying, but, yeah. I guess I want to look at the broader, the bigger picture here in terms of if this is an issue in Hinesville I, and in Blackbutt and many other places, I think we actually need to have a, a proper look at it and actually, you know, not sit on this for the next 15, 20 years and accept that it's okay, actually look at well, what is our position. And I understand that from a maintenance perspective, we have not had the budget and the resources to deliver on this, but I also understand we've made significant progress on our um, rural roads and perhaps it's time to actually start leaning in on some of these issues and um, 
trying to find a way forward. Yep. Thank, thank you, Councillor. I think we need to move on now, Councillor yeah. Jones, um, yeah. if we can. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other speakers before we go to the vote? Councillor Henshin. Just quickly, Mr Mayor, thank you. Can I just direct a question at you, Councillor Shoemaker? When you say existing residential landholders, is that going to incorporate the rural sector as well? I mean, the intent is anybody yeah. who lives there, Councillor. Yep. Um, that will be a number of rates. Rural and residential, I, you're a resident regardless of um, your postcode, in my opinion. Okay, very good. We've had that clarified. So any other speakers before we go to the vote? Let's go to the vote. Those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you all. 7.1, uh, now I'd like to invite Councillor Froloff to present the LDM Water and Wastewater Portfolio Report at 64. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> First of all, the Local Disaster Group update. Queensland Fire and Emergency Services held an award ceremony and equipment handover on the 9th of October up at Gimby. Members from the South Burnett SES unit were awarded with their commendable achievements. I would also like to once again take, um, take this opportunity to thank all SES members in receiving their national medals and all other awards. And I'd also especially like to thank Arthur Dawson, who has worked tirelessly for many years, over 30, 32 years, I believe, he's been in SES. For, and I'd also like to um, <coughs> let everyone know that the SES are the unsung heroes in the South Burnett. When there's a storm or an issue comes, they'll come out um, whatever time of the night to help people with roofs, trees, the whole works. So once again, I'd just like to um, congratulate and thank all the SES volunteers in this region. Um, the Water and Wastewater Branch Portfolio report the following are current and planned works, updated as of the 20th of the 10th. Capital works for 21-22 and current water main replacements are the SCADA and cyber security updates, replacing existing SCADA to regionalised systems, <coughs> and the KTP Kingaroy Alfred, um, Alfred Street to Haley Street, water main replacement, uh, all on the go at the moment, and all other 21 22 capex works are under planning. Um, also, the dam restriction and dam levels as of the 20th of the October, as all towns still remain, all levels of towns still remain on level three water restrictions. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the community in the South Bennett region for um, looking after their water supply and using as little water as possible. So thank you. So we're, we're high, um, highly regarded by other councils of the amount of water that our area uses compared to other councils. The key highlights are the Acting Deputy Director General of the Department of Regional Development, Manufacturing, and water along with the Director of Dam Safety and the Principal Engineer of Dam Safety had a site visit to Goodenbrook Dam on the 23rd of September to meet with operational staff to discuss the regula regulatory requirements for Goodenbrook Dam. Departmental, departmental staff have offered technical assistance with scope preparation for upcoming hydrological modelling for spillway upgrade. And Council continues to monitor water storage throughout the region and the current levels are as follows. Benduma Dam, 24.5, BP Dam, 6.5, Goodenbrook Dam, 62%, and Boo Bear, 37%. Um, our reactive works for the financial year to date, we have a total of 94 um, water requests for wastewater. They are um, two requests for the pump station, 16 wastewater blockages, 13 wastewater odour issues, 12 wastewater overflow issues and 51 of other wastewater issues. And the res we had 478 year-to-date water supply requests. And they are as follows. Hydrant um, valve leak, 25. Leaking mains, 131. Pressure and flow, 28. Water quality, 8 water service metre 162 and other water issues 123. Our completed capital works for noting is the KTP Haley Street, which a 200 millimetre diameter water main was replaced. 
and the KTP in Alfred Street was the water main replaced from Glendon to Short Street. And Wandoi in Haley Street, the water main replacement in Hodge to Scott Streets. And we have some great news. One of our um, employees, Andy Watson, um, has gone had went to Tasmania, but Longford in Tasmania is currently commissioning a new Narita wastewater treatment plant. Aquatech Maxcon has engaged the services from South Burnett Regional Council's water and wastewater team. The South Burnett Regional Council is providing Andy Watson is providing Andy Watson to perform commissioning of the Narita instruments and training for the TAS water operations team. Longford is the second Narita granulated ac activated sludge process in Australia behind our Kingaroy plant. Andy is recently was recently on site during the recent cold snap as he enjoyed the fresh two degrees temperature and the 42 kil um, kilometre hour winds. And some positive feedback why Andy was down there and hats off to him, he is a major asset to our water and wastewater team. Um, South Burnett Regional Council will be the lead council in this operational technology by promoting training in this field Maintaining the position only enforces a positive environment to increase interest and benefit to operational learnings and outcomes. Ownership and accountability of plant ensures what the money through delivery, value for money through delivery of treatment, maintenance and plant and process. His training encouraged, my training encourages interest and passion to the treatment plant. This, in, this ensures operators become more curious to possess which will grow solid work skills and encourages further training in operations which produces better outcomes for business and for the treatment process. It is essential to have high standards and high efficiency, efficiency to encourage ownership, which ownership is the final outcome, is a product, product that is safe and within licence um, for surface water release to be um, released and benefit for the environment. Professional relationships between operators and councils will prosper with the local estab establishment of the Australian Operations Narita Group and Andy is currently um, in talks with, with these, this group. Um, and South Burnett Regional Council is already the envy of other councils throughout Australia and the world with this plant. And his training was not paid by us, but paid the travel and the expense was paid by Taz Water and Aquatech Maxcon. So once again, I'd love to um, congratulate the wastewater team, especially Andy Watson. He is a major asset for our wastewater treatment plant and um, great news for the South Bennett Regional Council. Thank you. I'd like my, um, what is it? Oh, <laughs> my local disaster management group and water and wastewater portfolio to be accepted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Do we have a second? Councillor Henshin, thank you. Okay, speakers, Councillor Schumacher. Uh, thank you, Councillor Froloff. Certainly, I had the pleasure of, with yourself and Councillor Henshin meeting Andy and, and viewing our Narita plant, and that was by far one of probably the very best days I've ever had on council, actually the pride that that staff group has for um, what they do for our community, which is so important, is just amazing, very inspiring. So thank you for sharing. My only question um, for you, Manager Tim, is just in relation to, it's good to see that Gordon Brook Dam's back up at 62% and um, that, that's, that's nice. Um, I guess my concern just around Bindoomba Dam, I know we're watching it, 24.5% is now less than 25%. Mindful there are many other users and um, different environmental factors uh, in terms of the, the time that that storage actually will continue to um, deliver water needs to high priority users such as us. So my question is just around in your discussions or work with um, Sunwater, are there any predictions projections around the time frame if we don't receive the inflows and I know you know there is discussion that we will but are there any projections or any higher level conversations happening around if we don't receive the inflows we really need to um, 
to, I guess, bring that storage back up, um, kind of time frame, trigger points. You know, dead storage um, is, is only a few, um, yeah, I, I'm mindful of dead storage and while there might be water in the dam, very little, it doesn't mean you can get it out. So, um, yeah, just want to understand that bigger picture conversation around that how long we can actually expect the Nduma Dam at 24.5% to last um, in coming into summer with um, evaporation and things as well. That's also a factor. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, short answer is uh, we haven't had any conversations with Sunwater in this instance at the moment. Um, the longer picture, we will have to talk with them and, and see what their predictions are because it, it, uh, every... Um, um, summer period, I suppose you'd say, has a different scenario. But what I can say is they've renewed their uh, allocations for both uh, Bunduma and uh, BP Dam, and they've currently uh, re released at 100% for the uh, uh, high-priority high water. So at this stage, then on on their things, they're not they're not worried at the moment. Um, but we'll, we'll certainly start looking at it because uh, my understanding is uh, limited in the usage of beef, uh, Benuma is really you could have 12 to 18 months of supply at the current consumption if there's no inflows. So you're correct, there, there is a, 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 a worry there. Um, I think I've said it before, if we as a South Burnett Regional Council, totally ceased our usage of Bunuma water, we would, it would not actually impact on that, that downward trend, uh, given that our total allocation for the region is only about 18, 19 days of supply for another user. Yeah, yeah I guess I'm just thinking around that, you know, contingency planning and as they say in, um, Every flood, you should prepare for the next drought. And I guess, you know, I'm just mindful that we keep watching these dam levels decline um, while there is some rain forecasted, um, which is great. And, you know, you can see in the Gordon Book level, it has brought the dam up. But, yeah, I guess I'm probably just keen to understand at what point do we start having those discussions about um, and what are our contingencies if Benduma Dam, you know, at some point is not a fully 100% available um, what are the contingencies and plans we have in place around uh, ensuring continued water supply? Can, let's, let's move on. Um, other speakers? Councillor Duff. Um, th th thank you, Mr Mayor. I just, I just um, wanted to, an update from um, Councillor Froloff as the LDMG Chair. What position and action is the LDMG taking on the COVID vaccination rollout across the South Burnett? vaccination rates in um, the postcode of Mergen are well below the state average. Um, on the 17th of December, the, the Premier is opening the borders, uh, talking about closing borders of our, our regional, um, if we don't reach a certain percentage, which is 80%. Just wondering, shouldn't this be something that the LDMG should be um, taking into consideration and, and probably taking the lead on? Just wondering. That's just my question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Um, the LDMG has been working closely with Queensland Health and that we did have a, a media release to go out this week, but um, that is no longer happening. Um, it's easy to take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And that it's, it is an individual's sorry to say, but it is an individual's choice to be vaccinated. We can't drag them, we can't make people get this vaccination. All we can do is um, advise that they should get this vaccination. But LDMG is working closely with Queensland Health and um, the office staff, um, Donna and Tash and them, and also Aaron and Powan are all on board and they're on top of it, so thank you. Mayor, can I add to that, if you don't mind? Certainly, uh, Mayor made contact with PHN and um, um, Darling Downs Health again on the weekend, specifically in Mergen. That was handed over to Donna as the local disaster officer. 
there's going to be a specific pop-up clinic in Mergen a um, fortnight from now, week from now, um, and it'll be based at the Vic. The actual region's on Lean Forward, so uh, and, um, and and total agreement with Councillor Froloff. We're taking our clear direction from Queensland Health as an LDMG, and actually it's the DDMG as in the district that's taking the lead in this space very heavily. There's different districts have gone to stand up uh, where it leaned forward. Um, vaccination rates, as reported through the media, have actually improved quite a bit. Uh, I think it was 4% double from 52 to 56. The last one I saw, which was South Manette Times of all places, um, plugged to the paper for getting the number before we did. Um, which quite happens sometimes with information flow for the death second dose and about 70 plus percent for the first dose for the uh, council boundary areas. Um, the media release was a page four special advert uh, in consultation with the mayor that was uh, decided to be held until some further information come along so that we'd be able to, we're putting out a lot of media, both social and just free media and in inverted commas if the uh, papers pick it up. Uh, as, as they do, uh, police, uh, all the emergency services, um, the media, a big shout out to the media agencies, everyone's working together very heavily in this space and working extremely cooperatively and there is, um, in some of our, our specific areas are not alone within the state, there's pockets of, of, of for whatever reason it may be uh, and that certainly is an individual has to make the decision. Um, Pretty certain everyone in this room is double vaxxed now um, and we will continue to promote it. But yeah, districts at Lean Forward and there's a specific Mergen one coming again very shortly and it'll be based at the Vic. Thank you, Mr CEO. Uh, yeah, uh, look, uh, certainly uh, South Bennett Region's rates um, are tracking reasonably well in relation to uh, the averages across the state, um, but we do have pockets of concern um, particularly in relation to the Premier has raised concerns in relation to Mergen and Sherberg, the 4605 postcode. So you're very much correct in saying that that is a, a real area of concern, well under the state average uh, at that end of the burnout at the moment. Um, and I would think it's fair to say that our First Nations people are certainly um, struggling with the concept of vaccination from an anxiety point of view, a hesitancy point of view. So there is work to be done there. Um, I guess um, if we can perhaps, um, Councillor Froloff, keep the councillors informed as to what's happening with the DDMG out of district in Gympie as that progresses so that we can communicate that to the community if they have concerns about action being taken through that process. Thank you. Do. Thank you, Mayor. Anything further there, Councillor Duff? You're comfortable with that? Thank you, Mr. And, and again, I would probably just uh, yeah, get, um, yeah, encourage councillors to reach out to uh, myself, Councillor Froloff, or the CEO, um, and um, uh, support the uh, position of council moving forward. Councillor Hensham. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Can I just go back to water and I ask a question to manager, Mr Lowe, Jim Lowe. When Benduma Dam was constructed in 93, it had a capacity of 204,000 megalitres. Does sun water have a metho methodology of, like it does not hold 204,000 litres of water now with previous inflow and, and um, flooding with sediment? We all know as rural producers when our dams go dry we might have two metres, three metres of silt in the bottom of them. Is there a methodology from sun water that equates to that when they Judge Benduma, Benduma Dam at 24, 25%. Um, do they take into account that factor that what's in the bottom of that dam taking up water space? Uh, yeah, Mayor Otto and um, Councillor and, and other councillors, um, I will respond just generically to all dams um, and that uh, periodically uh, sun water will do bathymetric surveys. So they actually do a dam floor survey again. So from time to time, they periodically review it. Uh, to my knowledge, they don't estimate it in between those opportunities, and those opportunities sometimes are quite a long way apart. I do know that uh, in certain circumstances, in a number of local governments, those bathymetric surveys uh, have um, occurred recently. So I think it's a time-to-time -time process 
Uh, there would be an acknowledgement that there is a significant reduction, but I don't think they estimated in between those survey times. Um, there would also be other impacts um, that they take into account, which perhaps are more significant, and that's um, with the progression of time, the, uh, the uh, sustainable yields out, out of the storages, and, and they would be working far more closely on those. Um, and you see those reflected in their, their annual review, and the, the question from Councillor Shoemaker was on that line, at what po point does the operator review how much water they expect and how much water is left from an allocation perspective. So there are dam rules in Bundoomba which are cut off medium priority users quite early and that was subject to our NWIDF review. Um, uh, and that is for the protection of the significant amount of high priority water that um, comes out of that dam. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Uh, are we ready to go to the vote on this? Those in favour? Carried unanimously, thank you all. Thank you, Councillor Froloff. 7.2 is the Gordon Brook Dam Acceptable Flood Capacity, Concept Design, Safety Review Works and Budget Review at 73, Acting GM and Manager, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Uh, yeah, so this uh, this report is basically a, uh, a refresher of, of um, what we have brought to Council before. It's just to, just to um, demonstrate what the actions that we are required to do under the, um, under, under the direction from the uh, dam safety. Um, I, I didn't want to go into every step, but one of, one of the, on the uh, page 77 is probably the, um, the, the critical things. We've done a, um, a, a re-estimate or reviewed the cost estimate so the original estimate for, for the AFC works was around 11.8 uh, million, and that was back in 2013. So uh, we've got a, uh, a new cost estimate there. It's significantly higher, Mr Mayor. It's 18.5 million, and that's simply a, a CPI increases since 2013. So the original budget estimates are, are way out. Um, the the uh, after talking with the um, um, what, uh, what dam, regulator? dam regulator on site, um, we've came up with there. There is possible other options, as as we pointed to with, with when we're doing the AFC review. Um, we need to prove our theories, and and uh, part of part of that is is that we need to do the um, uh, redo the model and. Ultimately, we weren't supposed to do the model for another two years, but after talking to the regulator, if we do the models now, we can prove that we can limit the impact of, of impacted persons downstream and also possibly reduce the, um, uh, the requirement to actually do the upgrades. So either way, we've got to do it. Currently, our man, we are mandated that we've got to do those upgrades until we can prove otherwise. So this, um, so part of this process here is we're asking for a budget review in the first quarter, which we've put up, which is about two hundred thousand to do actual the hydrological study. It's money that we had to spend anyways, but if we bring it forward, spending that money now may save us significant money in the future. Um, so, thank, thank you, um, thank you, manager. So. We have a recommendation there as presented, but I think before we go to that, because it's quite comprehensive, um, being a standing committee, let's have a discussion about this and, and let's let's put questions to our technical officers. Um, uh, so, so the first thing, uh, Manny, just before we, before we formalise this too much, the 200,000 would enable us to do the hydrological study, the modelling as you call it, to be able to establish accurately at this point in time, what is going to be the impact, the potential impact on those um, properties downstream of the spillway? Am I, is that what we're looking at for the $200,000? That, yep. that is correct, Mr Mayor. And it also uh, will will uh, confirm or, or, or otherwise the actual requirement of the AFC upgrades. So because of the um, is it maximum permissible precipitation or probable precipitation, um, that, that has um, changed and been downgraded slightly. 
So by punching in the new model, um, creating the new model, we actually could end up with, we may have some upgrades, but it could only be a fraction of what, we've, what we're actually mandated to at the moment. So until we can actually um, uh, disprove the requirement, we're still mandated by what the regulator set back in 2013. And just to confirm the timing of that body of work, that modelling, to be able to then demonstrate its, its application to the current regulations, um, what time frame would we see that work undertaken? Which budget and which time frame? Sorry, Mr. Uh, Mayor, we put that uh, for the two, uh, 200,000 in budget review, the first quarter review, um, so because we need to, we'll have this finished by the end of this financial year so that we can actually uh, go forward and say, yes, we, we do need to do the AFC upgrades, or no, we don't, or we, or we downgrade the requirement. So we're asking the committee to, to um, recommend to council the consideration that when we review the budget to the end of December, um, which is coming up very soon, that we, we've provided an additional $200,000 to enable that modelling to happen, which could potentially give rise to a significant revision. Not necessarily, but potentially give rise to a significant revision to that capital upgrade requirement, that current $18.5 million. Absolutely correct, yeah. correct Mr Mayor. Okay, thank you. Further questions, discussion? Yeah, Councillor Jones? Mayor, yeah. I, I just want to endorse exactly what you just said. I, I fully support this and uh, in supporting the 200,000 to our staff because it brings our studies forward and it has it has the potential to be massive on how we go forward financially and and uh, progressively with the water situation that we have. So I this is a need, not a want. This is a necessity, and I believe that this is something that we need to find a way to fully fund and support our staff with the potential, as the Mayor has highlighted, a huge benefit financially down the track, possibly, not certainly, but it has the potential to enable us to change direction enormously in the way that we progress with our water water security and all that sort of stuff. So I fully support and um, yeah, the 200,000 and bringing those studies forward. Hey, Councillor Schumacher. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I too am fully supportive of this approach. I think anything we can learn and certainly plan for the actual eventual expenditure or project, whatever that may look like. I just, my question was, so in relation to the current rating, we have incremental flood hazard category. We're a high C. Um, so are you, I just want to understand from what you're saying, if we do this work, is there opportunity to revise that category? That is, you know, based on what we know, yes. So whilst we're rated currently based on the work that was done in 2013 um, as a I see if we do this work and really understand that um, flood, the potential of flooding better and the potential risk in terms of dam we're facing, um, yeah, we're much better informed in terms of the project moving forward and that um, certainly it's concerning to see the CPI increase from $11.8 million to $18.5 million. Um, as we've said many times before, with not an additional drop of water. So, yeah, fully supportive of this approach and, um, you yeah, know, just really grateful for the work you're doing in this space. Thank you. Um, so, so, Manager, just looking at what's being recommended to Council before we put that up as a motion, it would seem to me, and just correct me if I'm wrong, please, that, that item two of the recommendation goes to the budget revision to provide for the additional necessary assessment and reports. Would that be correct? That, that's that, the 200,000. That is correct, Miss Mayor. Yep, okay, that's item two. Would it be worth council, uh, then committee considering that we that we address item two, um, but we don't commit to items one and three at this point in time in term because we don't know what that capital budget's going to be? Um, be because, Tim, I guess I'm, I'm probably not prepared to jump in boots and all on committing to allocating the capital budget until we know really where we're at and what we're up for. And is that is that something that could, we could certainly address and consider once we get the um, report done? Once we get the new modelling and report done, could we then consider one and three then, I suppose, is the question? I guess we could, Mr Mayor. Um, I, I guess 
what what the um, line item one is is basically we are committed to that current stipulated AFC upgrade. So so it's really just a, a um, pointing out that we do have a, a, a currently we are committed to do that um, until we can actually prove otherwise. Um, we are mandated. I, I guess that's yeah. Yeah. And and then item three. Um, that we ensure there's enough money in the future works budget to allow safe drones to be effective. Yeah, okay, yeah, I could see your point. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah through Ms. Ms. Mayor. Uh, yeah, item three is is basically that. So uh, we've got that in those 10 year capital plans. Um, they're the other sub items that brought that project up to around 20 odd million back then. They're, they're, they're additional maintenance and capital items that. Against the, uh, uh, in addition to the AFC upgrades, yeah. I just I, I just know that there's some discussions happening with the dam safety regulator, and might be not terribly keen to commit at this stage if there maybe is another option to address the impact on the properties downstream that may not require up significant upgrade to the spillway. If we can look at other options to deal with the safety issues without actually upgrading the spillway, because as we know, it's not going to give us one extra drop of water. And the spillway at the moment isn't broken. It requires upgrading, is my understanding. So I guess I'm probably still not too keen to lock us in on one and three until we say what, see what that report says and that maybe we actually consider what other options are available to the people living downstream um, that the dam safety regulator might be, might be prepared to consider. Yeah, that, that's that's fine, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I don't think it really impacts on it because we are planning that way forward. Um, but yeah, that, I, I can't see an issue with it. Mr. CEO, as he often does, just suggested could we um, just maybe just tweak one and three to say that council will consider in our budget deliberations. Just to leave that a little bit open at this stage until we see what the report provides. Look, just yep. putting that out there for, for the benefit of discussion, Councillor Shoemaker. Yes, thank you. I just uh, wanted to understand, probably just further to the discussion we're just having. So, um, Tim, are you talking about, you know, that longer term, in terms of the intent of this motion, are you talking about Council's commitment to recognising that there are more than one project involved in the, the capital spenders over a longer period of time? And I guess are you looking for that assurity that Council will commit to that longer term capital works program? Or is it just this project in specifically just the spillway project? Or the, that's just probably from the conversation. I'm a little unclear from that. Yeah. So, so uh, the the uh, dot point one was basically uh, about uh, uh, surety of that the AFC will go ahead. Which honestly, we haven't got any choice. We're, we're mandated for it. So, but the other ones are are, are the. Longer term ones, they're actually in our ten year capital plan, which is is up for approval every every year. Yep. Just Mr. CEO, just um, start discussing options here to get this um, yeah result. Thanks, Mayor. Just just if the conversation. So if two is uh, every well from what I'm here, everyone's in agreement and I concur totally. We need the two hundred thousand because that will give us flexibility with some of the other options. Um, it'll be picked up in the second half, a uh, second quarter or second half year review, second quarter review. So, Mayor, if we did two as a separate and just put it out of the way and lock the 200 down and then the other two, uh, just as part of tagging on to the end of that, that question and answer, uh, will be considered in any which case for the, we're effectively starting budget discussions on this now for, for one of a simple because It'll need to get folded into the loans program if that's where we're going, or if it's not, if it's going to be funded through. So all that modelling. So if those other two are considered in the budget deliberations going forward, they'll just get picked up as part of the normal budget process. Yeah, thank you, Mr. CEO. Uh, okay, so is any response to that in terms of your thoughts, appetite for the committee to to fold one and three into our budget process with our forward planning, forward capital planning? At this stage, and let's lock in a commitment to uh, the budget revision on item two. Okay, so that being the case, um, probably looking for someone to move that the committee recommends to council uh, item two as presented at this stage, so we can at least get that commitment to the team. 
Uh, Councillor Fradoff, thank you. Do we have a second for that? Councillor Potter, speakers for or against? We'll just address item two first. No, go to the vote on that. Carried unanimously. Thank you all. Okay, um, then coming back to items one and three. Um, sorry, Linnell. Yep, that went through unanimously. Yep. Uh, and and just yeah to be clear, is the committee happy then to leave one and three uh, as and then general manager can we bring that forward into the budget process to make sure that that's in our forward capital budget so it can be uh, deliberated on by council as part of the budget moving forward. I'll be happy to leave that at this stage. Yep, no one wants to move to and one and three. Happy to leave it at that. Yeah. Acting GM, did you want to make comment on that? Will that will that frustrate your process at all if we do that? Not at all, I don't think, uh, Mayor Otto and councillors. The, um, the take home out of this is that we've got a number of um, licence conditions. They're immovable. They will not move until we provide further advice. The advice upon which they were conditioned dates back to before 2013. A, a couple of studies, actually. I think it's 28... 2008 and 2013. So um, the take home is that while we were um, licensed to provide these studies in approximately two years time, we're recommending that you consider in a budget review, uh, bringing them forward to give us more certainty in relation to those budget discussions that you are referring to, Mayor. At this point in time, we have only one option and that's those submitted and uh, approved in conditions. But the, uh, with the assistance of the dam regulator, uh, the Deputy Director General and his team, they're opening our eyes to other options that should rightly be considered, all which must rely on updated modelling. Now, if we do that early, we may have to refresh it in two years' time. However, it will give Council some certainty in relationship to potential options that we're discussing. We will put numbers around them, get professional advice, and may well be in a lot better position. To have budget items this big sitting in your 10-year capital program significantly impacts the balance of your program. So having uncertainty around these numbers, jumping around $5 million at a time, is not really acceptable forward planning. So we greatly appreciate the support to consider uh, that bringing that forward in budget review. Um, those other commitments remain licence conditions and we will reconsider them uh, as we go forward with more advice. So I think it's, it's quite prudent. Um, one and three basically restated licence conditions. Uh, it, it just acknowledged that those licence conditions exist. And as Tim correctly said, our acknowledgement or otherwise doesn't change the licence conditions. So uh, I, think the, uh, I think you've got it exactly right and... We will work forward with this, and it's it's one of the most important uh, things that will impact council's budget over the term of this and the next council. So um, I think you're going exactly the right way. Thank you. Thank you, Acting GM. Okay, that being the case, now we'll move on to seven point three. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Do you want us to re just to resolve, or or is it that the committee recommends to council that the following items be considered in the twenty 22-23 budget process. Yeah, I think it hurt to have and that. that as way a, as we a don't get we, mixed up. We, we won't. We won't lose track of that, then, do we? Yeah. Uh, In the 2022-23 budget considerations. Yeah. Or deliberations, or whatever language you want to. Yes. Discussions. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, do we have a mover for that, Councillor Jones? Second to Councillor Potter. Thank you. Any speakers? If not, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour. Carried unanimously. Thank you all, and thank you very much, Acting GM and Manager Manager Low, for the work you're doing there. Um, look forward to that uh, coming through. Seven point three storm damage to Mount Wood and Reservoir Roof at page ninety. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting GM and Manager. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, this is uh, um, the Wood and Roof Reservoir. That's our uh, main clear water storage uh, treated water tank. Uh, it got uh, partially ripped off in the in the uh, storm in uh, 18th of October. We had to get uh, emergency um, uh, tarping done up by uh, a reservoir company. 
that's that's been completed uh, because the roof was removed. We had to uh, advise uh, Queensland Health and the regulator because it is a, a possible it was a possible um, a source of drinking water contamination. But uh, we then instigated our emergency uh, testing procedures and everything, and and we've got the all clear have have had the all clear all the way along. Um, the, re the reservoir is now tarped up so it is um, vermin proof as, as, it, as it's required by law. Um, but the, the uh, uh, reservoir company also did a uh, inspection of the remaining uh, structural members of, of the roof. There is indications that it has actually suffered um, some impacts, not only from the, the section of roof getting removed and landing on the residual part of the roof, but it was uh, they believe that it's actually had some uplift forces on it, and um, so they're recommending uh, replacement of, of the whole structure. Um, now, to do that whilst, whilst it's actually in service is, is a very costly exercise, um, and... and um, so what we're proposing, we're going to uh, do up, we've got some spare uh, uh, balancing tanks and we'll actually do take that reservoir offline with the view that we can then source local uh, timber and steel frame builders in the district to do it at a significantly lower cost because there will, will be no water in there. So it's basically we're after a, a, roof, a roof builder. Um, so that's it. That's our intent because the uh, the figures, although not quoted here, are very scary, um, and and I truly believe that we can significantly do it for about a tenth of the price, um, and and so this is the only way to go forward. Um, so basically, it was it was, it was an information and and um, that uh, asking for council to uh, to uh, allow us these options to 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 build uh, the office. The bypass so that we can actually get hopefully get locals to build it for us. Yeah, thank you, Manager. Uh, so the recommendation is that the committee recommends to council that council officers investigate options for the roof replacement and arrange for the replacement roof as a matter of urgency. Do we have a mover? <laughs> yeah, Councillor Frylov, second to Councillor Henshin. Thank you. Uh, speakers, Councillor Duff. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just wanted to know was um, was this covered by insurance, mm. and are we likely to get enough from the insurance to cover the cost? Uh, short answer is no. Um, with the, uh, my understanding is we insure buildings, we don't insure structures. Thank, thank you, Manager. But uh, yeah, good question, Councillor. So this will have to be a capital cost to Council. Um, but thank you for the work you've done on finding a way that you can actually empty the, the reservoir and build the roof, um, which is going to reduce the cost significantly for Council. Yes, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. But yes, uh, you're correct. It will have to be a, uh, a capital item. Um, I did uh, put in that report that uh, we've advised the regulator and um, and Queensland Health. They are very they will uh, are very keen for us to keep them informed as to when it's going to happen because it is a risk. It's, even though it's tarped up at the moment, we get significant storms. It is uh, only they're a structural tarp. They're not like your standard cotton tarps or anything like that, but they still are at a risk of, uh, in heavy storms. So the regulators are happy with what we've got there now, but aren't going to necessarily uh, allow us to leave that there for a long period of time. They'll want us to deal with the issue fairly quickly, I'd imagine. Yeah. Absolutely correct. Okay, all right. Um, look, if, unless there's any other speakers, are we ready to go to vote on this? Councillor Schumacher? Uh, just a question, just in terms of that insurance. So you said we only insure buildings, not actual infrastructure like this. So is that, um, you know, a, a gap there? Is there further work that needs to be done? Can you insure facilities like this? Or does the cost of that outweigh, like have we done that sort of cost benefit analysis? Because that just seems like a bit of a risk to the business. Um, I can't personally speak with, with this one here. Um, I, I'm not sure of the, of the, how we came to, where it is, I know a lot of councils have worked at. We do self-insure um, for those sort of things, um, and others do insure them. Uh, but but a lot of councils do just do self-insurance. Yeah, thank thanks, councillor, and thanks, manager. I think we might 
take that one on notice for GM Jarvis to look at our insurance in relation to these sorts of assets and perhaps come back with that information at some stage in the future. I know there's been work happening with insurance reviews across the organisation, GM. So, um, But at this point in time, I think we really need to give you the green light to get going, don't we? Tim, you need to get action on this. So let's go to the vote. Those in favour? Carry unanimously, thank you all. Thanks very much for the work you and your team have done there, Tim, in keeping that um, supply going and being able to find a really good strategy to reduce the cost of fixing that roof. Thank you. Uh, okay, now we're up to 8.1, which is storm, uh, sorry, question storm damage, goodness me, uh, in my brain now. Uh, 8.1 is questions on notice at uh, 92. Councillors, you can see them as presented there. Uh, question page 93 contains the detailed responses. Uh, is there any Discussion, any further questions? You comfortable with those responses? No issues? Okay, well we've got the, um, we've got then the motion that um, the recommendation, the responses to the questions raised be received and noted. Do we have a mover? Councillor uh, Henshaw, thank you. Second to Councillor Froloff. Those in favour, carried unanimously. Thank you all and thank you to the staff for providing those responses to those questions. Um, okay, I'll now move an item in relation to uh, item 9.1, uh, that Council considers the confidential reports listed below in a meeting closed to the public in accordance with section 254J of the Local Government Regulation 2012. 9.1, construction of a formed road to lot 29 RP36980 and lot 10 M5421 Memorambi. This matter is considered to be confidential under section 254 254J-G, as stated and presented uh, in the agenda. Uh, so I'll now move that. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Potter, thank you. Those in favour, carried unanimously. Uh, we'll now call the meeting uh, closed as we go into confidential committee. Thank you. Okay, well, we welcome back all. Uh, yes, yeah, welcome back all. Thank you, Mr. CEO. So, um, Yes, indeed. Uh, so the recommendation is that the committee recommends to council that the requirement for the construction of a formed road to lot 29 on RP36980 and lot 10 on, on M5421, Memorambi is the developer's responsibility, that the current constructed road does not meet the standard and that this advice be reiterated in writing to the developer. Do we have a mover? Councillor Jones, second to Councillor Froloff. Uh, any speakers? We'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Councillor Jones, Councillor Potter, Henshin, Froloff, Schumacher and Otto. Those against, Councillor Duff. The uh, motion's carried five votes to one. Thank you. That now completes the business of, sorry, uh, six votes to one, sorry, can't count. Uh, six votes to one. Uh, and so that now completes the business of the agenda for the Infrastructure Committee meeting. As such, I'll now call the meeting to a close at 1pm. Thank you all for your attendance today.